Good evening. I'm calling to order the April 14th, 2022 uh, meeting of the Finance Committee for the Town of Shrewsbury. My name is Mark Adler. I'm your cruise director. We'll be starting tonight. Um, we don't have minutes to review, Alex, or we're going to handle that next time. That's fine. Then we'll go straight to Mr. Mizikar's uh, report, unless you want to get to that later. No, I'd be happy to. I'll go through it really quick. So Hit it. I just, just wanted to advise the Finance Committee, as we have done on a monthly basis, we've updated the local receipts uh, in your drive. Uh, very strong through the end of March. Um, we've collected uh, 10.1 of the $10.9 million that we've budgeted, so we're in a good position. Um, the principal assessor has advised that motor vehicle excise commitment two has been received by the town, and we're working to get that out, uh, which will be additional revenue, uh, the largest uh, additional revenue source coming in before the end of the fiscal year. So it's in your drive. Happy to answer any questions if there are any, but that's all I have for my report. All right, this is a very good looking, uh, these are very good looking numbers. Uh, anyone have any questions um, on our local receipts? This is, these are the, basically the dollars we take in above, um, well, on the side of our usual uh, tax receipts uh, that fund the town. These are the things that are a little bit more variable, less perfectly predictable. Um, so it's always, you know, we're always waiting to see what the number is going to be. Would anyone on the committee have any questions on the local receipts? Okay, seeing none. Anything else? Is that for the report? That's it for the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we actually have, if you can believe it, a reserve fund transfer request. This is the first one of our fiscal year, which is um, exciting. They, uh, the Finance Committee is budgeted $230,000 to um, basically shore up the budgets of the rest of the town. Okay. Um, and we are empowered by the town to transfer it from our reserve fund to any of the departments that need it um, without having to go to town meeting. This is typically money that is uh, appropriated at town meeting. And um, Mr. Mizikar, will you explain what this request is for, please? Sure. Um, this request is for uh, to cover the additional workers' compensation premium that was identified through our annual workers' compensation audit. The total amount of the request is $28,727. Workers' compensation is audited um, one fiscal year in arrears. So the uh, company goes in, uh, of course, workers' compensation is based upon total payrolls of various positions and a, and a rate is applied to those positions based upon a number of factors. So when they came back in, uh, as they do every year uh, after the first of the year, the 2020-2021 year, our 2021 fiscal year, uh, identified an additional 28727 in premium that was due. So. Given this is an unforeseen expense, uh, we are requesting a reserve fund transfer in that amount. Unforeseen request is the name of the game when it comes to the reserve fund. Um, members of the Finance Committee, have any questions, comments, suggestions? Ms. O'Connor. Kevin, have you had, um, in the last couple of years, have you had um, discrepancies with this before? Um, some years, I mean, it, it really depends. Um, you know, the the numbers have been a lot closer than this. It's a little higher than normal. But uh, we reviewed the premiums with the uh, insurance agent this morning, and I, I think the budget number that we have this year will hold. So, um, but it's, again, it, it really depends. Like, so we won't be audited for fiscal year 23 that we're working on right now, you know, for 18 plus months. So it's, it's a little hard to be exact. Do you have anything to attribute to why it's higher? Um, for, it's the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, it's just, uh, just overall payrolls from, from what I looked at with, there's no particular category. We added a few police officers over the prior year. We did a general cost of living. Um, all those things kind of add up across the bottom line. Thank you. 
Other members of the committee, any questions on this? Uh, what is the budget right now for uh, this item going forward? And what was it in this year when we sure. were Sure. So it? workers' compensation, uh, I have to pull it up. Can I remember 400 some thousand? Yeah. Yeah, four, uh, Alex, please, 409,000, roughly the total premium that's in this year's budget. Okay, so this is roughly five or six percent off of that. Correct. Um, I mean, kind of going on with what Donna was saying, um, what is our confidence level that we're going to be uh, managing this number properly going forward, and do we need to consider um, modifying our FY23 for this? Uh, I do not believe so. We did. I had the insurance agent in this morning, and we did review numbers that we've used in the fiscal year 23 projection, and they are roughly 4% uh, higher than our current year's uh, estimate. Uh, our current year was quite different than the prior year because of the roughly $4 million in additional salaries associated with the opening of the Beale School and uh, related district-wide changes in the school department. So I am confident that I don't, I'm not sure that we're going to be perfect, but, you know, we'll, we'll be much closer than we were in fiscal year 21. Sure. Okay. And none of this is COVID-related because that wouldn't fall under workers' comp, right? No. Okay. So it wasn't those unforeseen circumstances. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Dennis. Uh, <clears throat> were there a lot of extra claims, workman's comp claims over the last year, or was it No, the same? our mod, our modification, which is the number that's applied to our um, salaries and wages, is declining. So it, it's, a, it's an increase in salary and wages okay. versus okay. negative uh, claims. Further questions or comments or motions related to this request? Move we approve. There's a motion second. to approve and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of appro approving the um, the reserve fund transfer, say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carries and the request is approved. Um, since this is my first one of the year, should I sign this now or do you want to make sure? Yeah, well, I'll bring it up for you to sign. Okay, otherwise I'm going to forget. <laughs> All gone. Okay. That's good. All right. And why don't we turn, thank you. I'll get this to you in just a few minutes. Um, why don't we turn now to the public uh, hearing on our annual meeting warrant. Uh, before uh, we proceed, we will need a motion to open the public so hearing. Moved. Second. Uh, second by Carlos. Any further discussion? All in favor of opening the public hearing, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Public hearing is open. Thank you. All right. Now, we have a uh, reasonable number of articles, reasonable compared to every other year. Uh, looks like we've got um, 48 to go through, we are probably not going to take them in order, depending on what the committee would like to do. Um, I've been advised by Mr. Mizikar that we have uh, many guests here to speak, and I want to accommodate the folks who are here today and make it easier for everyone's schedule. Um, before we go any further, I just want to advise everyone present today and anybody watching that the committee will be making recommendations on every single article. However, the recommendations will not be voted on tonight. They will be voted on either at our, uh, I mean, they will be voted on when our public hearing is formally closed and we've gotten through all the articles, uh, which I do not expect to be tonight. If we don't get through all the articles tonight, we will continue at our next meeting, which is in two weeks, uh, April 28th. And we might even continue it to the uh, so-called um, pre-town meeting, which is also a finance committee meeting that evening. So we'll be voting on it once we've uh, finished uh, hearing everyone's opinions and suggestions. So although we will be listening to what everyone has to say, and we'll be giving you uh, our feedback as well, but we just won't be voting on it. I just want to make it clear because in the past there's been questions. So um, there is... <coughs> a suggestion from the town manager that we take the articles out of order and that we start with um, the 
planning and zoning articles, if that is all right, those would be articles 29 through 35 and then proceeding from there. Is that right, Mr. Mizikar? That is the recommendation, yes. Does anyone have any suggestions, complaints, or approvals of that? Okay, don't need a motion. I can just decide that by fiat. So let us start with Article <coughs> 29, and I see Mr. Cahill is here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bernard Cahill. I'm the Director of Planning and Economic Development. With me this evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, is Ro McAllister, Assistant Town Planner. She's going to be speaking this evening about Article 30 with everyone. Uh, Article 29 is the uh, Community Preservation Committee's budget for fiscal year 23. As you can see in front of you on Article 29, it's divided into 10% um, reserves as required by state statute, historic, uh, historic preservation, I'm going to always get it wrong, hum uh, open space and recreation, and um, what am I missing, affordable housing. Um, and then the other remainder is proposed 5% for administrative costs um, borne by the or decided upon by the community based, the CPC, Community Preservation Committee, um, and then 65 for the general reserve, which can be used by the CPC for any of those uh, specialized areas. So this is, this one's pretty easy. Next year it'll be a little more, well, we think it'll be a little more complicated when um, projects start coming forward and they're eligible and they get recommended and so on and so forth. But this year it's just to put the funds that have been accrued in this fiscal year into FY23 in accordance with um, the state statute, those percentages I just read off. So are there any questions? Members of the committee, uh, any questions? Yeah, Dennis. Yeah. Um, on the expenses, uh, $51,000 for this year and 52, which I guess is that percentage point, what are those going towards? Yeah, that's a great question. So the CPC can use it for um, things like due diligence, so if they need to hire a consultant, they could do that. If they need to hire an uh, extra administrative staff for some reason, someone to do research, they can use it on that. They could also use it if they had to on advertising a public forum, so making uh, posters and whatnot. So. And when you say hire, that would be a consultant or a contractor, not a full-time Shrewsbury hire? Cor correct. So they're not allowed to supplement our salaries through the CBC funds. Okay, yeah. So I'm just making sure. Yep. No, that's state statute as well. And then if they don't um, use all that money, it just rolls back into the fund? The general reserve. General right. reserve? Yep. Okay. No. How is that funding, uh, the spending of it, how is it monitored and how, who, what department or who approves that spending? So town meeting approves. No, 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 the $50,000. How? If, if they spend money in a certain, for a certain specific reason, does it go through the town manager's office? Who, who approves that and who's the oversight? Of the administrative costs. I don't believe they require town meeting approval, right? It's their own to spend. It's, it, it. The money would already be approved, it, so. It, it would go through the general warrant process, though. So just like any other expenditure that would be in the operating budget, it would, you know, flow. We'd, we'd pay bills administratively through the Planning and Economic Development Department when authorized by the Community Preservation Committee, and it would flow onto a normal warrant and ultimately be signed off by myself. Okay. I just wanted to yep. be sure that that was in place. And I had one more question. Do they expect to spend that much this year since there aren't any projects out there yet? So um, my understanding is the project's coming year two, so I'm just trying to get a feel of what they'd be spending this year. Yeah, that's hard to guesstimate even this far out. We don't know how many projects are going to come in this fall, so it's hard to say how much help they're going to need or how much um, uh, due diligence is going to need to be done. It depends. If we have 20 projects come in, I could probably get pretty close to spending most of it, but if we get two or three, probably not. But I. I'm hesitant to give you an exact number at this time. Okay. I guess that would fall back to her question is just making sure that that money is, you know, spent in a good way, a positive way. Yep. So. I mean, and we staff, I mean, Rowan and I staff yeah. CPC as well, so we're there to yep. give guidance and advice, you know, and help them out find someone and the appropriate person or consulting firm. Okay, great. Any further questions from the committee? This is a public hearing, and I welcome any comments, suggestions, or complaints from the audience. If so, yeah, Ms. Hollenbeck, why don't you proceed over to the podium there and state your name and, I don't know, address. I think that's the style 
um, of the day. And Mr. Molina just walked in, so I was going to ask me. if someone from the CPC wanted <laughs> uh, to speak. My name is Melissa Hollenbach. I live at 38 Stony Hill Road, Precinct 9. Um, what I Everyone's you know commenting about the staffing for the 5% um, for the administrative costs for CPA. Um, Mr. Malik, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but up to 10% can actually be allot allotted. No? Okay, I'm wrong. Um, my numbers are too much there. Um, so it's a very small amount, and it's very, um, it's consistent throughout most of the communities that have CPA. Um, so again, it could be for any, uh, there's a lot of, going to be a lot of programs that are going to be going on and it's really a lot of like getting the word out to public I just spent you know fifty dollars on you know a handful of flyers at Staples so you know the cost like that so it, it might seem like a lot but it kind of works away and then also occasionally if you look at the MMA um, job listings um, you'll very frequently see um, assistants that are, are you know required you know that are um, being offered for various CPA programs so it's pretty common um, that they might need some help every now and then someone especially when they start getting into some of these projects they're all over the place so it's kind of a normal thing um, not not anything tricky yeah go ahead Dennis yeah no thank you I asking the question because this is the first year we've had the program and I just want to understand how everything's being done not questioning what's being done but understand what the flow is and I think the public has a a right to understand that as well. It should be listening to this meeting and understanding yeah. that. So yeah. thank you for explaining yeah. that. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that you know everything will be going through town meeting. Yeah. So that's one of the really beautiful things about CPA. So um, and Mr. Molina can correct anything um, as he already did. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Molina. Do you want to speak, or does anyone from the committee formally want to make a presentation? It's you have not not a requirement. Just you're here. You want to do that? Sorry, was there a specific question? No, no, Mr. Mr. Cahill pretty much covered the. Uh, the effect of the article. Uh, anyone else from the public have any questions, comments, suggestions on this article? And Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. We will now move to, actually, before we, we go any further, I just want to ask um, the town manager's office, we've got titles on the articles up here, but they're not listed specifically on the warrant, probably because the warrant was drafted and signed by the selectmen quite a while ago before the details were worked out. But I'm would it help um, town meeting members to, to have like a title heading on the articles when this goes to print since we are still not ready, we, won't, we aren't exactly going to print just yet? <coughs> could, we, could we do that in the booklet itself? Uh, we could, but we traditionally don't. Um, some communities put them on the warrant itself, but I think that's something that we may want to revisit for a future year. That would be my recommendation. Uh, could we just append these titles that we have now onto these article numbers, you know, bef before we go to print this time? Th could this be that time to do that? It could be. I wouldn't recommend it, but it could be. Is there any opinions pro or con from the committee on this fascinating issue? Um, I've been through a few of these, and it hasn't been an issue for me with having the numbers. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? I, it might be a good thing for future, but okay. Anyone else? Okay, then let's uh, let's let's think about this for next year. <coughs> Thank you. Um, okay, now let's move on to Article Thirty, um, continuance of existing uses. Yep. Mr. Not Mr. Cahill. No. Uh, hello. I, like Bernie said, my name is Rowan McAllister. I'm one of the assistant town planners in the planning department, um, and I'm also uh, the ZBA staff. And I'm going to present this one because it pertains to when a special permit is required by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So essentially, we're looking to make these changes to Section 4 of the Zoning Bylaw because we want to align the text more closely to state statute as well as incorporate some recent case law decisions that have come up, come up in the last few years. Um, the main meat of the change is in Section C uh, on page 3. And that section relates to pre-existing non-conforming single and two-family structures. Uh, we are proposing to no longer require a special permit when an alteration or expansion, reconstruction of one of those structures does not increase the nature of the non-conformity as it exists on the structure, lot, or use, you could say. So we have a list of one through four that illustrates some scenarios that 
that apply to this uh, statement and, and will no longer require a special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals, or we so propose this. Um, the number one pertains to non-conforming lots but conforming additions. So we're proposing to no longer require a special permit when a uh, conforming, a dimensionally conforming uh, addition is constructed on a non-conforming lot. Number two con uh, addresses conforming additions on non-conforming structures, meaning the addition conforms dimensionally but does not, but, but is added to a house that does not conform. So let's say you have a front yard setback that's short you're going to add an addition in the back, and it's not going to impact that front yard nonconformity. You can go ahead and do that by right. Number three is going to be a like for like replacement. So that we'll no, we're proposing to no longer require a special permit for. Um, this would be something like if you have a deck in, your, in the rear of your yard, it's falling into disrepair, you can remove and replace it on the same footprint without a special permit. And then um, last isn't as common, but uh, we're proposing that a special permit should no longer be needed when you want to demolish a portion of a pre-existing non-conforming structure. Perhaps what's left over is still non-conforming, but less so. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman, for any questions. Members of the Clarifying. committee, any questions Clarifying. or comments <laughs> on this article? No, I think it makes sense. I think it makes I actually went through the deck issue once would have been great if you'd done this 15 years earlier, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, this seems to basically clear up um, unnecessary uh, paperwork that doesn't, you know, um, the way I understand, at least the way you, it's been drafted here, um, this is designed to take it um, not to excuse any non conforming uses, but rather to excuse conforming uses that might be coincidental because there's a non conforming. Nexus going on. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have a shrug from Ms. O'Connor, which is good enough for me. <laughs> Ms. Loss? Sure. Um, Mr. Cahill, could you just please provide the committee and members of the public where in the process the articles are before the planning board and when those recommendations would come due, just so the Finance Committee has that uh, background? I was actually, yeah. Certainly, I probably could have started with that. Uh, May 5th. We had one meeting already, uh, was it two weeks ago now, the first Thursday of the month? Um, so that was the first public hearing on all of them, but Article 35, which you're going to hear later tonight, um, they weren't quite ready. Um, and then that's May 5th is the meeting. So at the end of May 5th meeting, we'll have the uh, planning board recommendations. Okay. For that reason, um, it's more likely than not that we will handle voting on at least those articles, if not all the articles, our recommendations on them, at uh, the Finance Committee the night of pre-town meeting, because that way we will have heard the planning board's recommendations, because fr frankly, you know, we'd like to take that into consideration. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, any further questions on Article the 30th? As a public hearing, would anyone in the public have uh, an interest in this or just curiosity would like to say something, comments, questions? Okay, hearing none, seeing none, we'll move on to Article 31. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Article 31 is regarding slopes. So what we're proposing here is slopes of a certain height, in this case, 10 feet or greater, with a certain grade, a two to one or 50% slope, would now require site plan review by the planning board. Uh, the reason for this is over the few past few years, there have been some challenging slopes on different project sites where the board has needed extra review for them. It hasn't always been clear that they have that authority. We've gone through back and forth, arguing with developers and so on and so forth. We did get those reviews, but it would sure be nice to be able to just say this is indeed part of the process when we have these types of slopes. The, um, this was worked out with um, Jeff Hallen, head of DP, uh, director of DPW, and uh, Andy Truman, the town engineer, to we discussed the, um, the steepness of the slope and the height and so on and so forth. And their advice was based on size of equipment and at what point you're going to have to start getting equipment up on that slope and or either much larger equipment on site would be at about the 10 foot level. So um, in conjunction with DPW and engineering, this is our uh, proposal. Any uh, questions from the committee, Donna? This is kind of a stupid question, but would this come into play only at the beginning or does this come into play at any time 
on an existing property and how would people know that um that's a good question um most of the time this is on new development we're not really seeing it on existing development come in um if it's a retaining wall involved over a certain height then the building inspector or zoning enforcement officer is involved and she would notify us um that's most of the time on residential projects certainly on existing we don't see this what we're seeing is <coughs> excuse me as shrewsbury really gets built out we're seeing that developers are getting more and more creative with their lots and where they're putting things and they're starting to cut into more and more steeper slopes is that like when they were on a cliff is that what you're describing a yes the house is on cliffs that we see around town now yeah or at the bottom um, we've had issues with that as well at the bottom so drainage and the like so right. to be able to bring in a geotechnical engineer and review these is very important for the board it's very important for later review for so many different reasons including the new tenants and uh, people at the top of the slopes who might be existing tenants so how so. would you address that with those that might be a potential problem that you see that already exists does this cover that only if they're making alterations to it if it exists does that make sense <laughs> so oh, yeah but I, that doesn't mean that what they have is appropriate correct but we're not we would not have the power to go back and make every um and also it doesn't say they can't be that way this is just the review right so they could be steeper than this and exist for the last 30 years it's just that if something new comes in that's this steeper steeper or higher it would re trigger that review so a steeper and higher slope than this that was put in in 1980 doesn't have to conform to anything new because we're not proposing that it's just the review process okay thanks yep. for the questions from any members of the committee anyone in the public like to make any comments on article 31 the 10 foot statement um create so that basically means it's a large enough project it's not just me digging in my garden 10 feet is a significant construction project is, yeah. that, is that the reason for the 10 feet? If Correct. That minimum? Yeah, and I mean, I may not be standing. I'm six feet tall, so 10 feet. I mean, we're talking close to the ceiling in here, right? When we start to get to 10 feet, that might be 12. Um, but pretty high up. Yeah, you're not talking about something that's around your patio. We're yeah. talking about a significant um, piece of work in your, your yard. And that two to one, 50% grade. So it's 50% over the 10 feet, or is it just any 50% yeah. so cut two to in one a 10 grade foot? So it's 50% grade. So right, right. But is it like a one to one slope? So at two to one slope, that would mm -hmm. trigger it one and a half to one one to one and we've seen both one and a half to one and one to one proposed um and again it gets the board very nervous and we've actually had some trouble i don't want to name any names because it's a public hearing but we've had some serious trouble at some projects recently where we've had one to one slope and we've had to make them change it um due to sloughing of the slope um uh concern about the people who live at the bottom of the slope and so on and so <laughs> forth with that review when we can get that geotechnical review ahead of time before they start getting in there that peer review can come back and say to the to the planning board this was our review this is the result and we need them to change this because this is our concern about health and safety and then that's when we get it we catch it early is the idea not after the fact when things start sloughing away um, and that's really the intent behind this but is they uh is this any disturbance of any kind on any slope that is two to one and that wretched 10 feet or is it a 10 feet worth of disturbance you know is it any cut into it that's what I'm wondering about not above the 10 feet it's within that 10 feet or more Mo or more or more yep okay anyone else from the public have any questions on this okay seeing none we'll move on to article 32 Great, thank you. Article 32 is to provide the town clerk with the power to renumber and uh, the numbering and alphanumeric numbering of the zoning bylaw um, without having to come to town meeting for a two thirds vote. The reason for this, and I was surprised, actually, Rowan and I were both surprised, um, the whole staff was surprised that this was not already in um, the zoning bylaw. So, for example, I mean, we've been making changes, or I should say, Shrewsbury's been making changes since 1967 to the zoning bylaw. Things get missed. Um, something that might be, you know, A through F is suddenly we realize it says A, B, C, you know, F, and it doesn't say A, B, C, D, just because things have been changed over the decades. Um, one through seven might be one through five or so. Numbers get lost. The point is, is that this would give the clerk the power to make those changes 
uh, make the numbers match up without any substantive changes, without having to come back every time to town meeting for that two-thirds vote. Thank you. Any members of the committee have questions or suggestions? My concern with this, um, I've done a lot of work in legislative drafting um, in my time, and it's not a, a small project when you change letters, numbers, um, you know, they're, they're left out of, on purpose, um, or they're left out by accident, but you, you know, you can't just willy-nilly put them in. So there has to be some, um, some check and make sure that it's not just done because someone's editing a document one day. Um, I've certainly been at a lot of town meetings where we've had to go through the two-thirds process, and it, it is a pain, and it should be easier. I just want to make sure that – I, I just want to say it's not a small deal, and it's not a, a small thing because uh, the law, which is what this is, uh, can be damaged if mistakes are made in this regard. And giving the clerk unilateral uh, power to make change – it's effectively to make changes in the law um, concerns me if there isn't some kind of – check on this to make sure it's done properly. If it's done properly, that's great. Um, would it just be a matter of well, her or him being able to, to go at it with Microsoft Word, or is, or is there more to it than just that? Uh, leaving Microsoft Word aside for a moment, um, no, it's uh, the town clerk. So town council, when they're uh, helping us write this, actually put, inserted, would you believe it or not, town council into the process. I so definitely they, believe it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they have to, um, any change that the town clerk has to be consulted with and run by town council. And then they have to make a recording of what change it was and when it was made and keep it in their files at all times. So it's a great question, but that's how the town council has proposed we cover that oversight. I think that's, that's definitely sufficient. Thank you, Dennis. So does that actually mean it's gonna cost us more to change it in a shorter process than just having us vote on it. Well, the town council would have had to have uh, reviewed it if it I, went I'm to town meeting that. anyway. So it's 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 not an extra step. It's, it's uh, and it's, it's I don't know how much he charges per hour, but I <laughs> yes, um, I would imagine if it's simply a number of say A through F has been rearranged for some reason, it's going to take if the clerk's going to say you know track changes. They're going to be able to look at it in a matter of minutes, I should think, and say okay, that looks all right. Um, might there be more intensive numbering changes? Possibly, but yeah. I'm guessing it's going to be mostly the small stuff. Having been on being a town meeting member, I know it's kind of a tedious piece to go through, but from financial perspective, I hear what you're saying. I don't really want to lie in a lawyer's pockets. Right. Well, the lawyer's coming to town meeting and advising us there, too. Right. So that's yeah. one less thing that she or he's going to have to do. So. so, and is this normal for every other community? You said this has surprised you, so I'm taking it this is normal. Um, they do it? There, well, I mean, define normal, but there's a lot of communities that do do it this way. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on the committee? Anyone from the public? Okay. That's great. Um, let us move on to Article the 33rd. All right. Article 33 is regarding common driveways, specifically uh, residential units on um, common driveways. I just want to make clear, nothing's changing with commercial and industrial lots and common driveways, how it's served. I, we parceled it out here just to make that clear because they were lumped together in one row. So now residential stands on its own and commercial and industrial stands on its own. So there's no changes to commercial, um, the number of lots and commercial industrial uses. What is changing, in fact, really the only change is the number of total units that can serve, be served by a common driveway. So the number of lots is staying the same. It was three before. We're proposing to keep it at three now, number of lots that a common driveway can serve. What we're doing is putting, proposing a cap on the number of total units. So you could have in a three lot uh, common driveway situation, you could have two single family houses and one duplex, or you could have two lots by one common driveway and two duplexes on each lot, but no more. Um, the reason for this is actually quite recently, um, if you know the common driveway down at uh, Old Mill Road and Main Street, the corner there, um, the developer had originally come into the planning board and proposed six total units on an 18-foot wide driveway. Um, the board found that completely unacceptable. They didn't find for safety reasons, for all sorts of reasons, um, an eight-foot driveway servicing that many units. Um, in fact, they, they felt that they were quite skirting the subdivision bylaw and the intent of why we have subdivision roads. At some point, you just need to build the subdivision. Um, so taking that as kind of um, 
encouragement, if not enlightenment. And I've been out to that site, and I can tell you, thank goodness they limited it in their conditions of their decision to four units because I've been out on that site, and it would be really tight with another four probably cars with two more units on that site. So the idea is to limit this to four uh, units total, um, but not to change the lots. There is, I can stop there. Oh, there's one more section, but go ahead. I was just going to ask, how often does it happen, and is Ford generous? Um, it is still by special permit. So if the board thinks that four isn't the right situation, I got to give them credit in this situation. When they saw six, they limited it to four. But it's, go ahead. The reason I'm asking <laughs> yeah. is because it seems that if you drive on certain roads, you suddenly see all these houses tucked in and think, how the heck did they get there? And it, and it's almost, it, it almost feels like the builder is taking advantage by doing what they do. And so I wondered if three was even being too generous. Four was being too generous. I mean, four, sorry. Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, I would combine that. So some of the, we do have a lot of common driveways in town. Um, this is in some ways preventative. We see this coming and we're trying to head it off at the pass. That's one thing. Second thing I'd say is that we've had a few um, other additions to the zoning bylaw in the last few years, like lot shape factor, if you recall that from a few years ago, so you can't draw these right. zany lots yeah. and stuff. So that would also help prevent some of the ones we see in um, certain parts of town that are from like 20 years ago, where there are these really zany lots and they have this common driveway going up through them to reach each of them. Right. Um, so I think we have, we're kind of tackling it from different directions. I kind of feel like this is, you know, I don't want to say the final <laughs> piece, but I just think what I'm, guess what I'm trying to say is that I think you're going to see, because of all these different things, it would limit it to just this number. I mean, if you're proposing we keep it at three total, I mean. My, my reason for asking yeah. is it seems that there's a certain section of town, I don't even know if it's the same builder. I have no idea who, who it is, where you got houses on cliffs, you got all of a sudden houses tucked in behind houses, and you think, how do they fit them in, and, and, and why is this happening? It just seems like it's... I don't know if it's contagious or what, but it, it just seems extreme lately. So here we're, we're trying to limit the number of bedrooms in apartments, um, you know, to one, to two. You can't add a third. You can't have a loft. And then all of a sudden we know that those residential homes usually have more children, and it's like they're just – being smatted into a little section. So I, I didn't know if you were taking control that you might want to really take control of it. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, well, I guess I kind of a two-part question. First, first part is what's the definition of a common drive um, driveway versus you talked about a, a subdivision. And second of all, um, it seems to me like we have minimum lot sizes and minimum frontage sizes and a lot of a lot of types of requirements and I mean is this being onerous in the fact that now we're saying we can only have four um, whereas maybe more could fit um, and they comply with all of the rest of the frontage requirements and lot sizes that we have so it's a two-part two-part question yeah so I think it's um, it's mostly that 18 foot capacity the concern is that at some point when you have that much traffic, you need to going to have, you're going to need to bring it up to a subdivision standard. So that's the difference. Driveways don't really have the same. That was my first question. What's so, the so difference that's, between so, a all right, common let me answer driveway that. and a subdivision? Yep. So a common driveway is, it's a driveway that is deeded to all the um, people who are served by that driveway. So they all have rights and to access it and they all have to repair it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also different standards. So like what you see here, actually you don't see all of them here. Um, but what you see here in terms of curb cuts, grades, thickness, and the like, is nothing compared to what a subdivision road has in terms of drainage, in terms of the types of materials used, so on and so forth. So you're talking a different quality, you're talking different, not just width and dimensions, but also all these other components that come with a subdivision road. And it's in it's an, our professional opinion, but also I would go out on a limb and say in the planning board's opinion that at some point, you just need to build that subdivision road. Um, 
we're not going to have 20 a 20 20 lot common driveway right you're going to want it to be a subdivision road all right um so i think that's the intent of it all and right. okay well I, I feel a little bit better based on that definition that you're saying that once you get more than four um i guess it's units that then now you've got to start to bring that up to a subdivision i just i kind of the opposite look i'm not for you know building every square inch here but i am you know from for for property rights here you know i just don't want to be overreaching and onerous of saying hey you can only have four just to make it that much more difficult but i i think that's a fair point that if you're going to have more than four units um then you need to bring it up to a subdivision quality so i i feel feel good about that so thank you for that clarification welcome to just add to that, um, a subdivision roadway creates the frontage for lots. A common driveway, those lots already have frontage on the existing roadway. I'm not sure I understand that, what you just said. but <laughs> so a, a subdivision roadway creates frontage for new lots and would allow new development in which a common driveway services lots that already have frontage on an existing roadway. So you, you and your neighbor, for example, in your residential lot with your common driveway between you, you're both on the road. You have the frontage already. Mm -hmm. Whereas a subdivision, there's a r little subdivision road coming off the road, and you all have frontage on that subdivision road, Correct. not necessarily on the main road. Okay. So, all right. Real quick. Yeah, go ahead. So this wouldn't address when you come by some of these shared driveways, or, or maybe it's a mini subdivision, I'm not sure which, where there's houses behind houses, and they all start on the same, appears to be a driveway going up. Hmm. Um, you go down 140, there's houses behind houses. I don't know how they have 100 foot frontage because it's right behind someone's house. But, so that's just a whole different thing. They get through the zoning laws on that point. There were, there were common driveways that allowed eight, eight lots off of a common driveway at one point. I know in 2011, we limited the common driveways to three. No, I guess my lots. point was these would not have frontage. If, I'm, if I have a house in front of me, and the main roads in front of that house, I don't have that frontage, right? You need to have frontage somewhere right. to so develop. There's your some. Lot. Okay, so those houses already had all those weird they have angles frontage. up. They have frontage, and yes. they're fine. Yeah. Okay. Any other members of the committee of questions or comments on this? Ms. O'Connor. Okay, this is my last question. Has the fire department reviewed this? Um, they they're aware of it. They haven't given me any comments in response to it. So, if you have a common driveway versus a legitimate road, a subdivision road, can a fire truck get up it? You know, yeah, can you get is, your emergency vehicles in there? So they had the fire department um, hasn't responded to this zoning article yet, um, but they have responded to common driveways that we had, including the one I'm talking about down off of Old Mill in Maine, um, where they said they didn't want to see more than four units. Like they thought six was at 18 feet wide to get a truck down there to service six units they thought was extremely challenging um so they would much rather see a, a much wider road so and that, I, I can certainly get their opinion and that fake road driveway common driveway is it plowed yes are there requirements for that yep so we require a copy of the deed we don't like the so. deeds they're private but they we do before anything gets any building permit gets issued or a certificate of occupancy occupancy gets issued um, they are required to submit deeds, the developer, showing the um, shared responsibility for all that maintenance, plowing, drainage, all of that, that it's shared through all the people who are um, privy to that common driveway. Thank you. Anyone else on the committee? Any members of the public? Clearly we have some issues about it. You all must have some. Solenbeck. Lisa Hollenbeck, um, Precinct 9, uh, 38 Stony Hill Road. Um, does this also apply to 40B type projects um, as we move ahead with CPA type projects? I have yet to see a multifamily make use of a common driveway. Mm. Well, that's no, not true. I have yet to see a 40B make use of a common driveway, but it, um, I mean, I suppose, I mean, it would, okay. but. I would think for something, most 40Bs have extensive enough units that they're gonna to wanna to have probably a dedicated driveway. Um, most of them aren't building on rear lots. 
with small access. Yeah, I'm just thinking as, as the yeah, no. CPC you know, moves yeah, ahead with question. options. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Now, if I'm right, um, the purpose of this is mostly just to split the commercial and residential language here. At least that's how you introduced it, right? And to make this small change of the four to uh, the three to the four. Yeah, the purpose of the formatting is that's correct. And right. the, really, the only substantive change is that adding a four unit limit. Okay. That's. We had a long discussion on the substantive, but in, you certainly presented it as this is just a formatting thing with this one little twist. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is fine. I'm just, I just want to make sure I'm getting us back to the subject at hand. Thank you. Anyone else in the public? All right, let's tackle number 34, uh, please. All right, number 34 is um, regarding landscaping strips between uh, lots with industrial uses in the limited industrial zoning district. So currently there is a requirement for a five foot green strip between of uh, grasses and shrubs between lots that are within. So not much wider than this table next to me. So not a lot um, between say a warehousing and distribution center, for example, and a, an industrial manufacturing use that there is a five foot strip between them. What we're finding is over the years, even when they are, have been included even before my time, these requirements for strips is that they're not being put in, um, that the zoning enforcement officer is finding it difficult, in, difficult and very challenging to enforce these and that it is not perhaps the best use of our time to try to enforce these. What I want to make very clear though is that the buffer between industrial uses and lots and residential is completely unchanged. All those requirements remain in place. The other thing is the buffers between uh, limited industrial in this proposal and um, private or public roadways, that's also a 15 foot buffer of green, has also unchanged. This is simply between, in between lots that are already industrial purposes. Only and limited industrial. Limited industrial, yeah. Industrial uses in the limited industrial zone. So, yeah. Do we have a lot of such uh, lots right now? Yeah, a lot of Route 20 is that way. Some okay. of it's because you see like the riprap, the different slopes, speaking of slopes, um, where it is n just almost physically impossible to put in a green strip. Um, but in other cases, it's just like, it's untenable. And um, it was requested, um, well, I say requested. We spoke with the zoning enforcement officer about this and worked together to come up with this solution. Ms. Cahill. Pat, uh, uh, Patty was machine. Yep, a uh, machine. Excuse me. Yeah, what, what yeah. No, we spoke about this. We made sure this was this language was um, worked for her. Okay, and she approved it and thought it was well written. So, okay, move forward with it. Splendid. Thank you. Questions from the committee. And members of the public, any uh, anyone who want to chime in? All right. And now the final article in this block, uh, loading in that same district. Yep, I'm going to hand this over to representatives from um, GFI, the proponents of this article. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Why don't you come on up and introduce yourselves, please. Chairman, committee, my name is Haley Palazzola, GFI Partners, 133 Pearl Street, Boston, Massachusetts. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is attorney, uh, Michael Brangwin. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Fletcher Tilton. Um, and we are here on behalf of the proponent of this article, uh, GFI Partners, who is a developer uh, who's done some work in Shrewsbury. Um, we've worked closely with members of the planning staff to come up with a solution uh, that we think is appropriate related to <clears throat> two, two aspects of development in the limited industrial district. The first is to change um, Section 7, Table 2, which is the dimensional regulation table, to allow for um, building height to be increased in the limited industrial district. Um, currently, under the zoning bylaw, the, the maximum height is 50 feet. The proposed amendment would allow for uh, the planning board to issue a special permit uh, to increase building height up to 75 feet. Uh, and the second change 
uh, would be to, to change, um, f that would be via a footnote um, to the, to the dimensional, uh, t uh, dimensional regulations. The second uh, proposed change would be to uh, add a sentence to footnote 12 in section six, table one, the use regulation schedule, which currently requires uh, warehousing uses uh, to have loading in, at the rear of the building. Um, this would allow for, again, the planning board via special permit to, uh, to allow loading at the front of a warehouse building. Um, now, uh, Haley's going to speak a little bit more to why this, uh, why, why, how this issue came up and why it makes sense. But kind of briefly, um, on the front yard loading, um, uh, there are certain there's certain areas of the town. Um, you think about the Hartford Turnpike, where there are residential districts at the back of where these proposed buildings would be, whereas more of an industrial use at the front of the building. Uh, and there was actually recently a project that GFI worked on at 440 Hartford Turnpike where uh, we went before the zoning board. Now currently, if you were seeking either front yard loading or even a minimal height uh, increase in height for a warehouse space, that would require a zoning variance. And as the members of the Finance Committee may be aware, uh, there are very particular requirements for obtaining a zoning variance that have to do with the unique circumstances relating to the lot, a hardship. It's not, a, it's not an easy standard to meet, and it really has to do with kind of e unusual lots. So not all lots where this type of treatment would be beneficial um, would qualify for a zoning variance. Uh, what we're proposing is that these two changes be allowed via the special permit process, which still vets the um, change allows the planning board to weigh in on whether this is an appropriate um, either, either increase in height or uh, loading in the front um, without that kind of very di high hurdle of a zoning uh, variance. Um, and, and for example, that project on the Hartford Turnpike, we had neighbors that came and we were proposing front yard loading as opposed to rear yard loading. They lived in the residential neighborhood behind the building and they said, this is great. We support this variance wholeheartedly. They came without even, you know, just from getting a public notice and saying, we want this. This makes it easier for the planning board to do that without having to meet these unique zoning requirements. So I'm going to let Haley talk a little bit more about the clear height issue uh, and, and how this will help the town. Thanks, Mike. Um, GFI put together a brief presentation. Um, I could put that up or just in the interest of everyone's time, I can just kind of talk through um, my thoughts. I'll leave it to you. I think we can skip some of that unless the committee needs that up. It depends can on. I'd send like us to the presentation. Yeah, I didn't see the present, so we would pre certainly appreciate seeing it the, in that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. sent to us. It could be sent to us because we're going to be voting on these later on. We can at least go through the presentation. If we have questions, we can get back. But absolutely, and I could even um, put it up and 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 skip over some slides just so there's some yeah. visuals too. Okay. Um, Let's. Well, yeah. I'm, okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, very well. Um, so, the purpose, as Mike said um, before, is to really. Um, allow for more of a flexible and modern warehouse space that um, we're seeing as the new industrial standards for class A tenants. So GFI is a full service real estate developer based in Boston, but we have about 17 million square feet of uh, commercial space and currently per permitting about 6 million square feet of industrial space across the region. Um, we at GFI own about 200 acres of limited industrial land in Shrewsbury. Um, we about two years ago purchased the Worcester Sand and Stone um, Worcester sand and gravel um, business and then the land that came with it. Um, <clears throat> we, as uh, Mike mentioned, that um, the, the purpose of this uh, zoning amendment would allow us to attract the um, Class A requirements that we're seeing in the marketplace, which the, the new standard for industrial clear height is 40 feet. And for those that aren't in the industry, what does clear height mean? So clear height is measured from the finished floor to the top of the ceiling below the mechanical systems, um, lighting, MEPs. Um, and so that distance from the finished floor back in the 90s was closer to 25 feet in height than to the 2000. 2000 it increased to about 32 feet, and about a decade ago, the new standard for clear height for industrial users is 36 feet, um, with 40 quickly becoming the new standard. 
So why at 40 foot clear um, does 50 feet not work for uh, what, what we're seeing in the marketplace? And that's because all of these industrial roofs are slightly pitched because we don't allow for interior drains, the risk of leaks onto the tenants, um, you know, supplies inside the warehouse. Um, so, so that's really why we think it's important um, especially for the town of Shrewsbury. We're doing this across different municipalities in the state right now. Um, we worked on a project in Charlton, Massachusetts that amended their bylaws from 50 feet to 75 feet with a special permit um, in their commercial zones, which allowed for industrial space. They went from 50 feet to 110 feet. Um, Uxbridge, um, Fletcher Tilton worked on another project in Uxbridge. That town went from uh, 45 feet to 60 feet. And then the town of Douglas is another town that allows for up to 60 feet. Um, I think it's important to note that we're also still ask, we would still be required to go for a special permit in front of the planning board. Um, and that really, we believe, belongs at the planning board. The same, um, you know, elected officials that are reviewing traffic, noise, setbacks, zoning, all at that same table, it makes sense that this decision would be made on a case-by-case -case basis on that site-specific characteristics. And, and, and that's why we believe a special permit um, fits. Um, as far as the loading goes, um, in addition to what Mike mentioned about the uh, Hartford Turnpike project that we worked on, a cross dock facility is also the new standard for these industrial users. Um, these, these big box warehouse spaces, um, they operate all as mini warehouses inside. So when you're trying to design a speculative warehouse where you don't know where the end user is, the first thing these tenants ask is, when you when can you deliver? How fast can you get your warehouse up? How many dock doors do you have? And the clear height. So these are all things that we're seeing in the marketplace. So being able to load on both sides of facility creates efficiency for the users inside the warehouse, among other um, you know benefits. This is, again, um, because we're trying to meet these growing demands of the way that all of us shop, e-commerce, um, everyone is changing how they operate in warehouse space, and that's happening with modern technology. You know, racking systems have increased by 20%, um, and that's inside the warehouse how, how high they can stack these pallets. So um, that's a little bit of background uh, about what we're proposing, and we're happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, sure, if, uh, if I may before. You Mr. Mizikar, yes, go ahead. So I just noticed an error in the motion that we have up there. Uh, we'll need to amend it. That um, It says building height between 51 feet and 75 feet. It actually needs to be greater than 50 feet, so we don't have that awkward between 50 feet and 51 feet that isn't addressed in our zoning bylaw. So uh, this was just a prior motion that we... So this is under 19? That's correct, yep. Under 19, so effectively what, what you're talking about, and you'll give us an updated yep. draft of this, you'll be taking out the words and 75 in the parentheses 75? Yeah, we'll be changing for, it will read a building height greater than 50 feet and whatever the appropriate word is, two or 275 feet. Two, it's, okay. It's correct in the article, it's just not correct in the motion, so we just need to change the oh. motion. Oh, that's, okay, that's one. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. That's a small problem. Uh, members of the committee, uh, Judy, you had. Right. Um, I guess my concern is, I mean, you led with the fact that, you know, that there's the limited industrial abuts, uh, residential, and that the residential people came and said that they were happy to put the loading dock in, in front, and I would concur with that. But I think at the same time, um, you know, these size of these buildings, as you abut these residential, um, I don't know how tall a, a typical residential home is, but going to guess, you know, a two-story home at 35 feet, Mr. Cahill, would that be about right? So if you think about, um, you know, going up to 75 um, feet, you know, that's significant um, building towering over the top of a residential home. And then if you take a look at the topology um, of the land, and, you know, if you look along like Route 20, particularly an area that that you're talking about um, the topology of where you would be building and then where the residential homes are, you're gonna have this giant building, okay? So that's one specific area. But in general, I mean, I don't think that Shrewsbury wants to start bringing in these great big buildings. I think that we wanna keep, I mean, we're a town. 
and I think we should maintain a town. We don't want to become a city, at least I don't think we do. Um, so I think that for a lot of reasons, given the way that, um, unfortunately, the way Shrewsbury has developed with so much industrial sort of merged with our residential area, I don't think that we should um, make this change. I have no problem, the, the part about the height of the building, I have no problem with changing, because I think you make a very good point that for where we do have industrial up against residential, moving the lo loading dock to the front, I think makes a lot of sense. So I don't have a problem with the whole article, but I do have a part with the problem with the height so I guess with the way it's written, I have a problem with the entire article. I would have to vote against it. Okay, thank you. Dennis, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I, I had two questions. If I, if I, Take your time, man. First mate. question was, you talk about this as the new Class A standard um, versus Class B versus Class C. I'm assuming with Class A, because if you do into REITs, Class A REITs get much more money. If we, we would want, as a community, a Class A to go in instead of a Class B, and that would bring in a lot more um, tax revenue as well that if you're going to the Class B or a Class C, it's probably not going to be as, uh, as beneficial to the town. Yes, that's, that's a, actually a great point, and I apologize I didn't mention that. That's probably the, the, the most critical point here is the, the estimated tax revenue for these types of facilities. And to your point, a Class A tenant, um, typically in the Fortune 50 or higher, um, you know, they provide better taxes. The buildings are valued much higher, which in turn turns into estimated tax revenue for the town. Um, and and to the earlier comment about um, you know being near residential neighborhoods, absolutely, and we agree with that. And some sites it makes sense to maybe consider a height over 50 feet, and other sites it it definitely does not. And that why that's kind of why we believe it's still required with a special permit give the power back to the planning board to decide within their um you know site plan approval process that they're already looking at everything height sight lines you know lighting from the from the, the lighting on site traffic all those other things that go into play for these um, warehouses it might make sense in one spot and it certainly doesn't in another but if um you know a fortune two company shows up to shrewsbury and they ask us as a developer can you meet our our requirements and i have to look at at kevin and and Kristen and say no we cannot you know that tenant's going to go to grafton that tenant's going to go to where you know worcester which um you know we we're very passionate about Shrewsbury. We have a lot of land here, um, and we're committed to the town. So, and then I, I could just add. One no, no, no I'm sorry, just Dennis, go ahead. Um, just, to, just to follow up, and thank you for reminding us that they still have to be permitted. Um, the 75 feet. How much? You said we've gone from like about 25 feet up to 40 feet now for for a Class A. How much does that give room within the the change for a future increase from like 40 to 50 feet for a Class A? It's a really good question. So these standards, as, as we mentioned, are kind of moving uh, very quickly, and we are having a hard time predicting where they're going. I think that the 75 feet number um, was decided on, and we felt that that was plenty of wiggle room. Um, as I said, the new standard right now is 40 feet. Um, so you know, we're just over that 50 feet mark by the time you get to the center apex of the, of the warehouse. But we don't know that a potential tenant does, shows up and says, you know, we want us. 55 feet or 65 feet because we have been seeing that is it it depends on how this operator operates inside whether it's it's a cold storage or you know they're they have multiple mezzanine levels um, it really depends on on each requirement but this we believe gives us a lot of flexibility to meet those okay thank you did you want to say something uh, yes Mr. Chair, thank you I just wanted to add um, uh, to Ms. Vetter's uh, concern and and I think maybe all any of the board's concern uh, the the special permit process um, uh, w would certainly, I think, vet out uh, some of these issues. If there's a, for example, if there was a 73-foot building proposed next to directly, you know, within everything as else as close as possible to a residential neighborhood, neighbors would, would be aware of that. They would have an opportunity to speak against that, and the planning board would be tasked with the special permit findings, which 
I won't rat, I wouldn't be able to rattle them off off the top of my head, but essentially that there the, the 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 site is an appropriate location for the use that the proposed use and the dimensions um, sat and meet meet the uh, the neighborhood uh, conf, uh, conform with the neighborhood things like that. So um, those findings wouldn't really exist, and and the planning board would be kind of the the vetting body to make sure that a 75 foot building wouldn't be going up next to somebody's house or directly next to somebody's house or in a way that really negatively impacts a residential neighborhood. Thank you. Donna, you had a question? Well, actually, you pointed out what I was going to, um, but I just want to clarify one thing because I want as much tax revenue coming in. But, um, Kevin, if there were to be a proposed site in it, wasn't really acceptable by the planning board and they use their discretion and say no to that height. What are our chances of winning in court or will it end up in court? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but in other words, you get some crafty lawyer who comes in and says, well, we're gonna take you to court then because we think you're not being fair to us. Will the town prevail or will you know how how would that trend go because i really do believe that it's important to keep the discretion with the planning board but is the planning board protected so i believe you're asking if the planning board denies a special permit right. request and the applicant appeals in court right I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. My only thought is I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on the findings that the planning board makes. So if the pl my, I'm hopeful that if the planning board's being reasonable, advocating for the, for the neighborhood, if they were to be that type of an infringement, um, that that would be a strong case for right. the town. Yeah, I would, I, yeah, definitely agree with that. I mean, they have the autonomy and the authority to make the decision based upon the criteria that they're allowed to work within. And, and that's clear and, and available and would be easily determined if it was reasonable in their decision-making process. So I would think that we're in a very strong position. Um, special permits are a very effective economic development tool uh, for situations just like this that are subjective. And uh, we haven't had any issues in the past. Um, you know, only recent court cases were dealing with federal communication issues and, and nothing even close to this. And I say bring on the revenue because the town will be better off and the residents. It'll protect the taxpayer. Does that count for residential lots that are stuck behind other <laughs> well, that residential was, lots? <laughs> that was the, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. That was the point that I was going to make is that it's, it's great to say, I mean, we all want to bring in as much revenue, but we spend a lot of time with, with zoning um, issues to try and plan the town and have the town be the type of town that we want. And I just feel like once you open the door to say, yeah, let's bring in, you know, the 75 foot um, buildings by special permit, I think we, we've opened that door. Um, it's going to be, well, you know, you're now saying it's okay to do that, that we want to bring in these large buildings. And again, um, you've got to look at where, I think if you sat down and you looked at, at residential neighborhoods that are budding limited industrial, you'd start to realize how much that is. I know that we've had a lot of discussions. We've done um, zoning. Uh, Mr. Cahill over the last couple of years has brought in, um, I don't know, there was the mathematical gymnastics of how high something could be and, and houses comparable to other houses in the neighborhood. And we've passed those type of, of zoning laws in order to, to maintain a certain look of an area and quality of life, if you will. And so I don't think that we want to just throw that out the door. Yahoo, let's bring in these great big buildings. I think it's something that really should be looked at. Um, and I would really ask the committee, I'd ask the, um, the selectmen, and I certainly would ask town meeting members to think about this very carefully. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead. I, I'd just like to say um, we're talking about business zones, correct? We're not talking about residential neighborhoods. We're talking about business zones. So we need to maximize 
the usage in our business zones to get the revenue and protect the, the neighborhoods appropriately, and that's the job of the planning board. Thank you. Dennis? Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. Um, a lot of the areas that GFI owns, I think it's a lot of acreage that's not, is it up against residential areas? I mean, the, the Worcester sand and gravel, I mean, I personally would have rather had a big building versus a sand and gravel in my backyard, having lived with one of those before. Um, but I think where the zones that are already there, that at least you guys don't, aren't sitting on top of neighborhoods. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, for your example, the Worcester sand site, that has frontage on Route 70, um, which is Clinton Street, which is on the outside of, you know, it's right on the Shrewsbury-Worcester border. Um, might be a perfect location for the town of Shrewsbury to, to take in significant uh, tax revenue and good jobs for the town and uh, send the traffic through Worcester. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's another really good point that the, the parcels that we're talking about are significant in size. It certainly doesn't make sense on a 12-acre lot on Route 20 that abuts, you know, this residential neighborhood. That's definitely not what we were proposing um, at 440 Hartford Turnpike. You know, that building height met well within the regulations. Um, so I would just like you to be, um, you know, open to this um, because this is this provides flexibility uh, for the town and still gives um, them the authority to analyze this on a case by case basis um, without completely shutting it out. Um, you know, we still would be able to build a warehouse. Um, it just doesn't meet these standards that would attract uh, the Class A users that we want to bring to Shrewsbury. Thank you. Dennis and follow up and yeah go ahead the other question is, I mean in Shrewsbury we have built on almost everything we can for housing um, we've talked about you have housing on cliffs you have housing everywhere else we have limited amount of commercial property but a need to increase the commercial revenue so I just from the finance committee from my perspective I think this is not a this is a good idea it's it's a good compromise um, giving the planning board the right to say this is not the right location for this you know maybe they would say on your current project, nope, you're not going 75 feet, and I would hope they would based on where it is. But in some of these other areas, to have the opportunity to do that, which is what you're asking for, but you still need the permit, we still have control over it. Um, there could be a lawsuit, but I think most towns win those lawsuits as long as they follow their process and procedures. Yeah. And we will do that. Um, I think it's a great win-win for Shrewsbury. Thank you, Dennis. I, I agree with you, with the exception of the uh, comment that we've built everywhere that could be built. Every time someone we says that, <laughs> there's someone out there saying, hold my beer. It is. There's always another place, that man. That's probably true. But there's always. It's like a challenge. We've been saying that for 20 years. We've been saying that for 20 years. Uh, Kristen. Um, just to give the Finance Committee members and members of the public a little bit of perspective, the Shrewsbury Housing Authority building on North Quinsigamon Avenue, that is 96 feet. So... Um, just when you're out and about uh, for perspective, um, that is 20 feet higher than, or 21 feet higher than 75, just as a perspective. Okay. Anyone else uh, from the committee who might about Worcester Sand and Gravel have an opinion about that? Okay. Uh, members of the public have any comments or questions? All right. I, I like. Uh, this no, I'm not wild about it, but I certainly understand the intent. Um, I think the idea of moving it from um, the variance to the special permit, but not leaving it by right. I uh, definitely wouldn't do this by right, but I think the process by which uh, this would go to the larger pro the larger review of the planning board and for the purposes of special permit. Um, if done properly, which is, you know, the way the planning board is supposed to work. I certainly see the validity of it, and I wait. Uh, I look forward to seeing it more in detail and hearing the planning board's uh, recommendation. But uh, in principle, I think this is, at least in my own personal opinion, uh, I think this is fine. So if there's nothing else, um, that concludes this section of our concert tonight. And we will move now to articles... 37 through 40 are tax exemption articles. Thank you.
members of the Finance Committee, uh, this evening we have Principal Assessor Ruth Anderson with us to walk through uh, Articles 37 and 40 and help answer any questions. I want to thank you for writing the shortest summary for the audience tonight. There is more in our paperwork than just what you all see up there, just so you understand. Um, I don't want anyone to think that this is uh, tiny. But we haven't actually dealt with such a comprehensive uh, collection of articles before. Usually it's more of a patchwork, an occasional article here and there dealing with tax exemption. So I suspect that a great deal of work has gone in to um, a project to assess, if you'll forgive the word, how we're reviewing these um, these exemptions and trying to come up with a with an overall rule and how to approach it. Is that is that a good way to sum it? I believe so. Okay. Well, first of all, welcome to the town of Shrewsbury. Um, and uh, what have you got for us tonight? Um, Mr. Chair and the members of the committee, thank you for seeing me tonight. I'm here to present these four articles and answer any questions that you might have. So um, Article 37 is a local option to accept uh, the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 60, Section 3D. Just to summarize, everyone that's here is probably familiar with the scholarship program that Shrewsbury has, where people have the opportunity to check off a box on their tax bill and donate money to a scholarship fund, which is then distributed to um, worthy graduates. So this is the same type of thing, except the funds would go into a tax relief fund, which would benefit elderly and disabled residents. The fund would be managed by a committee, which would be um, made up of myself as the assessor, the treasurer, and three members of the community, which are appointed by the Board of Selectmen. The funds that are collected would um, be distributed at the committee's um, distributed by the committee based on the parameters that are set by that committee. So we would come up with the rules, the regulations, the application forms, and then collect those applications and distribute the funds as we see fit. Um, and this is guided by some precedent in state law. That's why this is an acceptance of a state provision. Correct. So there's um, opportunity. It's actually the next section in the law after the one that sets up a scholarship type of thing. So um, the legislature in their infinite wisdom said, let's not only help the kids graduating from high school go to college, let's help the elderly and the disabled as well. Okay. Members of the committee, have any questions or suggestions or comments? Members of the public, public hearing, welcome all comments and ideas. All right, shortest discussion on any article. So let's move on to Article um, 38 in that same vein. So in the same vein, Article 38, actually the next three articles are um, acceptance of local options available within the law. Article 38 is uh, accepting Master General Law Chapter 59, Section 5, C and a half. This would allow us to increase the amount of the exemption that is required by law for people that meet the qualifications for all of the exemptions that we offer. So this is your seniors, uh, widows and widowers, blind exemptions, veterans. It would uh, allow us to increase the amount of the credit by up to 100%. That percentage increase needs to be determined by town meeting. All right, is this, um, we got, was this a financial breakdown we got from the manager's office on the effects of this, uh, I think recently? Yes. Yep. Okay, did it, uh, I hope members of the committee had a chance to see that or at least see that we have that. Um, and this was, these were amounts that were partially um, reimbursed by the state, is that correct? That's correct, so the reimbursement amount will not change. So any increase that is approved by the town will be borne by the town. Okay, so the, the flat amount wouldn't change, but so therefore that's on top of it. Correct, so the town would be bearing the additional cost. 
Could we have those numbers available? <coughs> just to, to pull up on the screen. It'd be um, if we're going to discuss it. It'd be good to have them. Yeah. That's a. As I recall, they were not. Um, yeah. Where was that? Huge impact, but. Yeah, it was. So while they're finding that, so if, if I just have a breakdown, I went with 50%, 75%, or 100%. A 50% increase would be additional, and these are based on the exemptions that we granted in fiscal 22, the only numbers that we have. So it would be an additional $55,145. We went to 75% additional, it would be $82,717.50. And if we doubled it, it would be an additional $110,290. Based on the last? Based on fiscal 22, what we, the, the numbers and the breakdown of the exemptions that we granted. Alex, can this be part of the packet that goes to town meeting members? This, because I mean, I can't, I, I can't read. <laughs> yeah, we can put it in the town manager's memo. Yeah. Because I certainly, well, I know that town meeting members will be curious about these numbers, and someone's going to ask. It would be nice that way folks have the numbers in front of them. I'm just trying to make it easier at town meeting. Thank you. Any qu other questions? Thank you, Dennis. That's actually uh, really where we should be going. Anyone else have any questions on the committee? Uh, I did. Yeah. So we have, uh, is this fixed once we pick the amount we're going to raise it until another, we do another warrant either to lower it or raise it again? That's correct. Yeah, but the 100% is the highest option. Right. Yep. Any other questions on the committee? So I believe, I think we can get to it a little bit later. There is the, what qualifies for an exemption, right? There's the, the means or income test or et cetera. Right. So yeah, I'm all set right now. Thank you. And this was part of the discussion last year when we were reviewing the override, wasn't it? Yes. yes. So, I mean, part of the Board of Selectmen's commitment to the community through the 2021 override was to seek any opportunity to provide tax relief. Um, and uh, a lot of work was done um, by Ruth Anderson when she came on board and uh, worked with, um, you know, board members to, you know, bring this forward. Um, so this is, this is that opportunity that, that we can have to help those in need in the community. Okay. Any other questions on uh, this article? Okay, uh, the public? Yes, Mr. Molina, if you'll please make the hike over to our podium. Introduce yourself and uh, what's the style? The precinct, the address, whichever Jason one you like. Jason Molina, Precinct 1, 31 Chestnut Avenue. All good. Also chairperson of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, not speaking on, my, on their behalf, but just representing myself. Um, I do have a question about uh, two, th two things. One is, um, are we already seeing exemptions uh, being requested for the CPA surcharge? Yes. Okay. And then uh, generally, um, to, as if we do nothing, if someone requests a, a exemption now, are we close to the limits that we cannot, you know, given the relief they're seeking? I'm just wanted to, trying to get, gauge the, the severity of the issue right now. It has, has good spirits, I think, to, to reach anybody who's asking, but I'm just curious, and I'm sure that's going to be a question that's going to come up at time meeting, which is, are we reaching the limit right now of, of, from the people that are asking for relief now? So the limits, the amount of the credits are set by statute right now. So we have to give a certain amount. So if somebody meets the qualifications, they're of the right age, their income and asset <coughs> limits fall within the proper parameters, they would get a $1,000 credit on their taxes. So that is partially reimbursed by the state. The rest of it is paid out of the overlay account. Um, this would increase, allow us to increase the amount of that credit. So people, if you meet the qualifications, you get something, but we're trying to get them more. So could I ask Mr. Molina a question? What, so what do you mean by limit? Mr. Molina, like the available funds that we have to to absorb yeah, it, this. What I'm just not understanding is that what what's the problem we're trying to solve for right now? Uh, what's the challenge that's being that's being addressed right now? Um, the way I'm seeing it from from where I sit, and it's only specifically to CPA in that specific that example, 
is that if someone is looking for relief on their CPA surcharge, are they not receiving that that exemption for that say sixty five dollars for the for the year? Um, are they getting only a portion of it? So just trying to understand the the issue around this. So CPA exemptions work a little bit differently. If they meet the qualifications, that is strictly income based. If they are at or below the median income set by HUD for their household size, then they are awarded an exemption of the full amount of the CPA. Okay. That does not come out of the overlay, it comes out of, it basically reduces the total amount collected. Okay. So that's a, it's an application, it's an income requirement, but the way it's funded and paid for is, is different. So if they qualify, they be exempt the entire surcharge from their bill. Okay. These statutory exemptions are different, whereas it's a set amount that's set by law of the credit to their regular real estate bill the CPA is affected because it's proportional. CPA is, is um, charged on the net tax. So if their taxes are reduced by $1,000, their CPA is reduced by $10. So it is proportional. But this is a little bit different in that we're trying to help people more than the bare minimum that's required by law. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molina. Anyone else in the hearing? Uh, Mr. DiPaolo. Good evening, Mo DiPaolo, uh, Precinct 2. Um, first, let me say I'm so happy that um, Ruth came on board because um, the board, for as long as I can remember, were looking for opportunities to uh, be able to save seniors and disabled people some money on their taxes, um, realizing that as our taxes go up, particularly with the last override, that there were going to be a lot of people that were going to be negatively impacted. Um, the to me, these are four of the most important articles on this warrant. There are others that are important. Um, if you're out in the community, you hear of people, not just people who like to complain about their taxes. You hear, if you talk to people, you hear there are people being hurt, um, which we knew was a possibility, probably a likelihood, by, by passing such a large override. Um, but we knew that we also needed the override to be able to operate the town and provide the services that we needed to provide. So in that vein, we spent a lot of time looking for um, opportunities, um, different laws to be able to um, help people who had um, financial limitations. And I, and I can tell you last year that um, what um, we had been told talking to DOR some of these things weren't possible, which, which was not correct. Um, because the, the particular one with the currently $1,000 exemption for the seniors, um, I was told it couldn't be changed. But in fact, it can. And if it was, we probably would have brought it forward last year. Ruth was the one who brought forward that, yes, it can. Um, the, it's not only the $1,000, it's the income limits that are being affected, and the income limits are going to be increased because this thing is like 20 or more years old um, and hasn't been raised so that the income limits are extremely low by today's um, income standards. So um, this is very, it's very important. I think it's going to open up opportunities for a lot more people uh, to qualify, and I can tell you, knowing some people that qualify for that $1,000 exemption pre this last override, we're very appreciative of being able to get that, and it helped them stay in their homes. So I think these things are extremely important. Um, we always talk about the tax revenues we need to raise and what we need to do in town government, which is all true, and it's necessary, but I think we need to be empathetic and compassionate about people who have difficulties paying their taxes and want to stay in their homes and honestly don't have options to move somewhere else. So um, I personally strongly support this. Um, I'm extremely glad that Ruth brought this stuff forward and, and knew about it um, because I think it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you very much. 
Anyone else in the public have any questions or comments on this? Yeah, I, yeah Dennis. I do have one question. Based on what Mo said, uh, if, we're, if, we, if we do raise the limits, the income levels, et cetera, is your um, estimate on how much it will cost the town, is that already baked in? That so that so that estimate of uh, I forget what the top number was if you went to the hundred percent of yep. is it a hundred and something thousand? That's got that's based on what we think the new um, amount of people petitioning for uh, for relief would be after all these four go through, if they all go through. It's within the overall financial plan. Yep. Yes. Yep. Just I thought it was, but yeah, sure. you know it's always good to let everyone know that that's yep. you guys done the planning ahead of time and we know what the cost will be around. And then one question, like our revenues this year are higher than we expected. Mm. And are we over $100,000 higher this year in revenues collected? Um, thus far, on the local receipt side, we're about $200,000 ahead of where we were last year at this time. Um, again, that's on a roughly $11 million line item. So we're continuing to see growth um, in those discretionary economic aspects of our revenue stream. That's great, because yeah. that growth could offset part of what this cost sure. would be taking on to help out, you know, the, the less fortunate or the more needy in our community. Sure. So, okay, that's good to know. Anyone else uh, in the public or on the committee? When we say um, less fortunate or more needy, we're only talking about seniors who would qualify for this, right? Folks over a certain age? No. Okay. So it's anyone that qualifies for any of the statutory exemptions we already offer. Okay. Seniors, um, there is an age requirement for some of them, but this also would apply to the people that get a veteran's exemption who have been wounded in service of their country, um, people that are legally blind, those as well. But, it's, but uh, low income is not the uh, only factor. You, they would still have to qualify. But that's an addition. Right, so the, the next two articles we're going to talk about are the qualifications mm -hmm. pieces. Um, this one, Article 38, is just to increase the amount of credit that is available to the people that qualify to whatever parameters are in place at the time. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll deal with that after we've gotten through okay. those. So, uh, I'm sorry, which are, we're, we're on 38, so let's move on to that. Okay, so Article 39, again, 39, is a local yeah. option. Um, of accepting Clause 41D of Mass General Law 59.5. This will allow us to increase the allowable income and asset limits for applicants of a statutory exemption um, by an amount that's communicated each year by the Department of Revenue. It's basically a COLA increase, and then we get notification from the DOR every year of what that is. So then we would use that number to increase the income and asset limits for people that are qualified, um, applying for an exemption which is based on age, income, and assets. So the limits currently in place for fiscal 22 and prior state that applications must have an, applicants, excuse me, must have an annual income of less than $24,911 if you're single, $37,367 if you're married. So $37,000 in Shrewsbury, it's about $3,000 a month. So it's um, my opinion and the opinion of other people that I've talked to that these limits are antiquated. So that's, that's what uh, encouraged us to move forward with this. The asset limits for this one are set at $40,000 if you're single, $55,000 if you're married, if you think you've worked your whole life, you've put away a little bit of a nest egg, it's probably more than 40000 and it doesn't mean that you're wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. So by increasing the income and asset limits incrementally each year, we can continue to help those that need it most. And also just bear in mind that um, people that are living pretty much strictly on Social Security, they get a COLA increase every year and they get bumped out of the program because they get a 2% or 3% increase to their income and it just tips the scale. So now they're over the limit. So they don't qualify when they may have qualified last year because we aren't keeping track with that. 
Any questions from members of the Finance Committee? All right, any questions from the public? Ms. Hollenbeck. Lisa Hollenbeck, Precinct 9, 38 Stony Hill Road. Um, I want to thank you very much for doing this work. This is something that we've needed for a really long time. Um, just a little word of advice um, is um, contacting you know, the DEI committee, the Council on Aging, the Disability Committee, um, Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services, and kind of get their buy-in on this um, for town meeting because I, these are all groups at the Veterans Council. Um, you know, really, this really impacts a lot of our community. And um, I think it's really important that it does pass. And I think getting the stakeholders to kind of weigh in on it, I think is gonna be really important for it to pass. So we have done a couple of presentations at the Senior Center and also to the Shrewsbury Men's Club to try to get the word out there. Those have been recorded and they're somewhere on the town, available on the town website or on the local cable with just some basic information. So um, we have been trying to get the word out. Thank you. I actually think the word, the word is getting out. It's a process. It's not easy, but it takes time and it will, it will work. It just, I'm optimistic. Right. It's just been difficult in my office, to be perfectly blunt, to tell people that I'm sorry you don't qualify, but wait till next year. <laughs> and I have told people, find out who your representative is for a town meeting and call mm -hmm. them up and tell them that this is going to be on the warrant so that yep. they can uh, use their voice that way. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to understand those numbers and that they aren't, they're not really high, those are pretty low numbers to want to live in Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. So it's, and I think town meeting members need to see some of those numbers themselves because there's always this thing, well, why am I voting for that? I have to pay the tax. Um, you know, yeah, if, if you're in a better position, you're paying the tax, but we're not trying, we, the override was to make the town better, not to push people out of the town. So <clears throat> we do need to make sure that people realize that this is very important for, I don't know if it's a large or small community of Shrewsbury, but it is something that is gonna help a lot of people, and it's not like they're living on $100,000 a year asking for this, they're, you know, and so. So I'd like to see in the warrant if those numbers could be you know, highlighted a little bit when it goes up to town meeting. Thank you. Anyone else in the public have any questions or comments before we move on to uh, Article 40? Article 40 is incredibly similar. It just deals with a different statutory exemption under Clause 17. This one is for people that um, do make too much money but don't have a lot of assets in the bank. The exemption is lower. Um, but this would also allow us to raise that asset limit incrementally by the cost of living increase that's um, communicated to us by the DOR every year. Fair enough. Any questions or comments from my colleagues up here? Or from I, the folks? Oh, yeah, the go question ahead. again would be what, were the, what are the income and asset levels at this, this level? So they're the same as the other. Okay. So $40,000 if you're single and 55000 if you're married. That relates to cash assets. Your house is not yeah. included, but bank accounts, IRAs, 401ks, stocks, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Anyone uh, from the public have any questions on uh, Article 40 or comments, suggestions? Okay, thank you very much, and thank, thank you, you for the presentation. Much. Appreciate all the work. This is, uh, this is good work. Mary's ready to go. <laughs> All right, let's uh, turn to the Assistant Town Manager for Administration and Finance. Is that the correct title? Yes. Yes, okay. We have Articles 41 and 42 on retirement. Okay, so the Retirement Board has two articles before you this evening. The first article proposes an increase to the COLA base from twelve to fourteen thousand dollars to increase this cola base for the retirees it requires requires approval of both the retirement board and town meeting the retirement board has voted this the board has delayed this proposal until the retirement system was fully funded which we were as of 1 1 2021 yep. so currently when we grant the three percent cola increase 
it's a $30 a month increase, and this will increase it to $35 a month. We have approximately 320 retirees. Not everyone will qualify for the full benefit if they're not receiving $14,000. Um, and of the 104 retirement systems in the Commonwealth, 60% of those systems are up to the $14,000 level or more. So we're looking to start that increase. Thank you. Is this going to be something that every time there's going to be a cost of living uh, adjustment in the world that you're going to have to come back to town meeting? Or is this going to start being automatic after this? The retirement board votes it every year. and. On the um, on the base, we're just here tonight to increase the base. So okay. when it, when we need to increase the base, that's when it goes to town meeting. We can increase the base up to eighteen thousand. At this point in time, the retirement board is just looking to increase it to fourteen thousand. Okay. Uh, committee members, questions? Dennis, go ahead. Um, what is the base for the Social Security um, cola? I believe that the cost of living is on the entire, the entire cost of, thing? yeah, the entire Social Security amount that they're receiving. So if I were a retiree getting fifty thousand dollars, I'm only getting a cola right now on twelve thousand of it. So I'm not. So when I get that three percent increase, I'm not increasing by whatever fifteen thousand. It's correct. You know, correct. So I just want to, you know, again, I think these are things, really good things to point out because. Um, people tend to say, oh, well, you know, we're, my taxpayer is going to someone else's benefit. And in this case, um, yes, we have retirees that do have pensions. That, that's great. But they're not, their pensions aren't growing the way I think most of the public thinks they are. Yep. And, you know, from that perspective, I think this is probably a good thing because, you know, if someone's going to work that long and get a pension, they should hopefully be able to, you know, last, live on it for the rest of the time. And why only to 14,000 versus 18? Um, we're having an actuarial study done right now. So we're going to review this every couple of years. But we, in, if going from 12 to 18,000, we just thought was a bit of a dramatic increase. So the board just said we're going to go 2,000 at a time and so Basically review being it. fiscally responsible and, and moving it in and making sure we're not going to impact the funded pensions that we, that we finally got to, which I think was a great thing for Shrews Ready to do. So, great. Thank you. Any further comments from members of the committee? Yeah, I just have one. The motion itself doesn't address the numbers specifically. It merely says that we're accepting the uh, provisions of, of the statute. Am I reading that right? Well, we're accepting the... Um the provision that allows us to increase the base. But the increasing of the base is by the retirement uh, board. So it's basically it's town meeting allowing the retirement board. I'm, I'm sorry, or am I misunderstanding that? Because there seems to be some confusion here. Well, do we need to have the, do we need to have the number in the article? I, I, I don't know if we have to have the number in the article. We'll check that we'll and check. update Thank that you. if necessary. It just, it, yep, good catch. It confuses me there. It's in the article, just not in the motion. Yeah. It's just numbers and money, man. What's the big deal? All right. Uh, hey, public, y'all got something? Anybody want to say something on this? Fund the retirement program? I'm so excited that we can start acting on a fully funded retirement program, like pension program. What is that even like? It's fantastic to see that there's this option to do this. So I'm, th this is what we get for fully funding it. We get to start putting real money into it. So that's great. I'm, I'm thrilled. Makes me want to retire. Okay, uh, let's move on to the other article in your purview, Ms. Thompson, Article 42. Okay, um, the second article raises the retirement allowance for accidental disability retirees to 50% of the current salary of the position from which they retired. Um, this article was adopted by a town meeting in 1988 and again in 2002. When an employee is disabled very early in their career, you know, the pension allowance just isn't able to keep up with inflation over time and the earning restrictions. So um, we have approximately 32 accidental disability retirees. There are 12 that have fallen below 50 percent of the current salary of the position from which they retired. And the majority of them have been retired for more than 25 years. So the annual additional cost 
is approximately $50,000 in payroll to bring these retirees up to 50% of the salary. Now, again, I don't see the numbers in this article. I just see that we are moving to increase the allowances. That's, that's, that's correct because various, you know, you could have a disabled firefighter or a disabled police officer, and it's 50% of a current firefighter's wage and 50% of a current patrol officer's wage. So we wouldn't include all of them. It would be 50% of any position. But it doesn't even say 50%. It just right. says that we're well, moving that, to increase it. Well, that's the only option under the general law is 50%. Ah, to increase it as the general law allows. Yes. Okay. We're cho it's a toggle. We're choosing it or not choosing it. We've chosen it. Correct. Kind of, uh, that makes sense. It's not clear from looking at it. It's, so I'm, I'm not sure if, again, if that's something we can do to help town meeting members understand that better, or maybe this is just Mark Adler's problem with misunderstanding how this is read. So, uh, any other members of my uh, friendly committee up here want to chime in on this, folks? Yeah. In, when they're getting the disability, that's because they're not working. They're not working anywhere else at the same time. It's not like they took, like, if I were going to disability insurance, I would get paid a certain amount, but if I could do another job, I'd be forced to go to that other job and take it and not collect disability. I'm just wondering how disability works for on the municipal side. There, there is um, an earnings restriction. Um, they can go out and, and get another job and work, but they are limited as to the um, and they're monitored by PEREC. Yeah. So annually they have to file with them and tell them how much they made. If they go over the limit, they do end up having to pay the money back. So, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Good question, thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Anyone from the uh, viewing audience, public, want to say anything on this or have any questions? Don't be shy. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation on this. If the committee will allow me, I would like to move to Article 27 tonight because we have some folks who've um, reached out to the committee and said that they wanted to talk about it from the public, and I would love to hear from them and give them a chance before um, we move to any other articles. So if I don't hear any objections from anybody, I'd like to just move straight to Article 27. Um, okay. So, uh, who wants to present this? Mr. Mizikar? Yes, thank you. Um, Article 27 proposes to transfer $140,000 from free cash to fund the development of a climate action and resiliency plan. Uh, the climate action and resiliency plan would be a community informed plan that will allow the town as an organization, that being the local government, to strategically reduce our carbon footprint print or our carbon excuse me our contribution to climate change by reducing or eliminating greenhouse gas emissions further it will prepare the town to uh, respond to and minimize the impacts of climate change on our infrastructure and resources the plan which would be advised and facilitated by professional consultants and informed with resident input would be actionable for the town and will inform and champion but not compel residents on how they can make investments in their households to reduce carbon emissions. We are requesting town meeting to approve the $140,000 for this initi uh, initiative. However, we will also be seeking funding through the state's municipal vulnerability program to offset these costs. Of course, any, offset, any cost offset by state dollars would allow us to turn back local dollars and reuse them for other future projects. Uh, this plan, once created, would be championed and overseen by the newly created position of Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, and the idea for this project was brought forth uh, through collaboration with the Board of Selectmen and several residents, many of which are here this evening. Uh, board members and these residents met to discuss climate change and find an appropriate path forward on this project. Um, and I wanted to just extend even uh, my special thanks to Diane Jones, resident, who helped uh, get me up to speed on plans like this. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before we take any public comment or even questions from the committee, I just have one question. Will there be uh, routine annual budgeting for this, or is this a one-time? I mean, clearly, this motion is a one-time. But will there is there a plan 
to make this uh, part of our annual fiscal year budgeting? It, it may require uh, budgeting in the future. Of course, uh, we would rely upon, first and foremost, external funds through the Green Communities Program. Uh, this year, uh, actually just today, we were awarded another $146,000 to tackle uh, energy saving initiatives. So uh, that program, along with the Municipal Vulnerability Program, um, in general, generally, as you know, uh, these projects require or provide us with great return on investment. So while there may be funds, we normally recoup them in a short period of time. All right. Anyone on the uh, Finance Committee want to ask questions about this? Although I do believe we're going to have some folks from the public speaking on this, or uh, we can certainly hold our questions Would until then. Would it make sense to let them speak first? They may yeah. answer the question. Uh, I just have a I formal. Agree. I'm supposed yeah. to pretend yeah. like we ask questions first, but. Okay. We'll wait. Uh, can I motion that we let them speak before we ask questions? You don't need a motion. They can just speak. I I'm okay with that. Uh, wh so who is it? Is it Mr. Howland, or are you just getting up to go? <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. Bad timing there, Jeff. <laughs> there you go. Boy, Point it out. <laughs> yeah, everyone, Jeff Howland. Uh, anybody uh, from the public want to have any uh, comments, questions, or presentations? Yes, please, come on up. Well, by up, I mean over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Diane Jones. I live at 29 Francis Avenue. I'm in Preci Precinct 8. Um, well, according to the February 2022 International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, we have a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future. Every level of government has to be involved for us to succeed. The economic consequences of inaction are unthinkable, and uh, as are the consequences for all forms of life on Earth, us, uh, our children, all of our descendants. I support a climate action and resiliency plan. It is an efficient way to get things done. Otherwise, every year, residents worried about the climate will bring a laundry list of random demands to the Board of Selectmen, and no one wants this. Random does not work well. A well-written climate action plan takes a systemic view. It establishes short and long-term priorities, driven by data, tied to a timeline. Other towns have already, already have or are working on their plans, and they have found that they can generate through state grants the funds to write and implement a climate action plan. Uh, we have all the technology in place. What we need is the political will. There's no substitute for a coherent climate policy. Last August 2021, Sulco presented to the Board of Selectmen the results of their customer satisfaction survey. 79% of customers say it is very or somewhat important for Selco to promote environmentally conscious practices. A strong majority wants Selco to reduce carbon emissions and balance environmental stewardship with fiscal responsibility. Selco has Shrewsbury ahead of other towns in Massachusetts. They are doing their part by committing to zero, elect zero uh, emissions electricity by 2032. The rest is not up to Selco, though. It is up to our town government. In order to mitigate climate change and prepare for climate resilience, we need a plan. I support a Shrewsbury Climate Action and Resiliency Plan. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public can have a presentation? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. My name is Shauna Parker Dalton, and I live at 8 East Avenue. We ha are already seeing serious disruption from only one degree Celsius of warming. And um, we've been told by the latest IPCC report that we have only three years to slam on the brakes and turn things around before we blow past 1.5 degrees. Um, so this proposal, even this late in the game, is absolutely critical. Um, my husband, Jack, and I have four children so I am a huge proponent of being prepared and having a backup plan in place for when the first plan falls apart. Um, by electrifying our city and eliminating our reliance on fossil fuels, we're putting ourselves in the safest, 
most secure position for whatever the future brings. We don't know exactly what the future will look like, but we know that things are going to get very weird. As a parent, I also believe in the importance of setting a good example and cleaning up messes. Even if somebody else made the mess more and they're not helping at all, they're just sitting there. We have an obligation to get off of fossil fuels as soon as we can to minimize the effects of climate change on those who are at greatest risk of harm. The good part is when we get rid of gas and oil, we have the added bonus of better health, um, healthier lungs and hearts, and um, children can even learn better without breathing particulates and the gases um, that we use in our homes. So I'm really glad that we're talking about this and I hope the town can move quickly to implement a strong climate action plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Um, I'm Gretchen Schultz Ellison and I live at 24 Spring Street here in Shrewsbury, Precinct 8. Um, first I'd like to thank the members of the Finance Committee for voting last year in favor of the article to declare a climate emergency at the May 2021 town meeting. Um, it passed overwhelmingly and I think that shows the support that the town had for that article. I'm here tonight to speak in support of Article 27 for the funds to be provided for the development of a climate action and resiliency plan. All of Shrewsbury's town departments and residents will need to take steps to plan for and adapt to climate change, and that is the purpose of a climate action and resiliency plan. SOCO has already started the process with its roadmap to achieving 100% carbon-free power by 2032 or sooner, because they know that carbon-free electricity is at the heart of addressing climate change. In addition to their own efforts, SOCO has also requested that the town develop a climate action plan, because it's the most efficient and organized way for Shrewsbury to coordinate all of the necessary planning and cl for climate impacts. I'm pleased that the Board of Selectmen is taking leadership in proposing Article 27 to create and adopt a climate action and resili resiliency plan to protect the town. I'm very much in favor of it, and I ask the members of the Finance Committee to support it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Hollenbeck. Hi, Melissa Hollenbeck, Precinct 9, uh, 38 Stony Herald Road. I'm forgetting where I live by now. Um, I'm also known as the Crazy Green Lady. Um, that's the name that people have given me in town who don't uh, like what I have to say. So I first appeared before the Finance Committee, I think it was about 14 or 15 years ago, regarding pay as you throw. And then I come back frequently with some, you know, crazy ideas, things like um, pay as you throw, the bag ban, uh, community preservation. Um, I was kind of behind the phone ban a little bit. Um, and then also the climate emergency. So Shrewsbury has been moving in, in the direction of understanding climate change. The other thing is the administration of, of Shrewsbury has been working with the state and the federal government by signing on to the programs, the MVP program and the Green Communities program. Uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when I tried to, to start an energy committee in town, we weren't ready for that. Um, we're ready for this now. The other advantage that we have is that we have a municipal light plant, which a lot of communities do not. So this gives us a huge advantage to really take advantage of having a climate action and resilient plan. Um, the way, the best way I can describe this plan, it's a health insurance policy, or it's, a, it's like health insurance when you get from your employer. You get coverage when you have that heart attack, but also a really good plan also gives you coverage to help you maybe manage your weight, look at your diet, uh, manage your medication. It helps you plan those things. So this is what this plan is. It's helping not only with planning, but it's also helping with preventing. 
And the other thing that we, we, we've talked a little about with, with the tax base in town is that we need to understand is that the people who are the most vulnerable regarding climate, climate crisis are those of low income and those um, of DEI and, and marginalized communities. So we really are helping a lot of people. Our wealthier people in Shrewsbury will not really be feeling the impact as much, but we really do wanna um, move it forward. So it's just a matter of, it's almost like the next step that we need to take. And I'm really excited that the town um, initiated this um, after we approached them. Um, I feel it's really a good, a good sign for that we're moving ahead for the future. Thank you. Oh, and one last thing. I want to mention that at the library, we have a new club that's starting, and we'll be having a movie uh, for the children and families at 4.30 on April 21st. And you can come in and uh, drop your kids off in one part of the room and come to the other, and we'll be watching a film by um, David Adder Attleboro, uh, Life on Our Planet, and then for children, a, mo a movie about climate change <laughs> called Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public before the committee uh, has its say or its questions? All right, anyone uh, up here like to chime in, pro, con, or otherwise? Uh, Carlos, sorry. Sorry, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I wanted to thank Diane and all the other um, community members for bringing this forward to us and for working with the selectmen. Um, to bring this to us, I fully support um, Article 27. I was curious about the timeline for the plan. How long would it take for the town to develop? Um, we tentatively scoped out six to eight months. Um, that would put us, you know, funding doesn't come available till July 1. We'd work to, you know, try to line up a consultant before that and, and work through the plan. Um, that might be a little bit aggressive, you know, but, um, you know, it's our intent to take action as soon as we can this summer. That's good. I think I think aggression aggression for this is is a good a good thing. Um, if we wanted to update it in the future, would that have to be initiated by town meeting, or can the selectmen do that themselves? Uh, it 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 could be initiated, you know, through the board of selectmen, or uh, depending on what sources of funding that were used through a grant, we may be able to just you know manage that without further appropriation. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what is the intended outcome of the plan? Is it going to be something um, voluntary for the Shrewsbury community at first? Is it going to be, or are we going to put in strict guidelines? And what types of things are we talking about? I, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I, mm -hmm. I support putting a plan together, but I just would like to know what we think will come, what the plan will entail. I know you have consultants and you don't know everything yeah. yet, but. Nope. So, I mean, if you, if you look at some of the, the other municipalities in the Commonwealth that have done this, I think there's two main takeaways. The first is developing a plan for the town as a local government. So think of just, you know, what we spend money on in the operating budget, DPD, DPW, et cetera. How do we reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions? How do we uh, improve the um, climate um, reduce the impact on climate change through our own actions as a local government. How do we electrify our fleet? How do we make buildings energy efficient? Um, so we'll develop that plan and it'll be actionable. The second part of the plan is um, providing information and opportunities, but no demands or requirements upon residents if they want to make their own investments in their homes Considering a new roof, what are your options? Um, considering an electric vehicle, what are my options? So we want to be a champion to them, but not uh, a regulator of their own decisions uh, in, in this light. So this is really going to, what we get out of this actionable plan for the, act, for the town government itself, right. they'll be doing that, and theoretically, you'll do it in a cost-effective way. Sure. Um, and then for the residents, it's going to give us opportunities to be able to learn how to do it on our own, could also end up being rebates. Selco has given out rebates before that type of stuff. So it's not really going to be a, a huge cost to any of the town except for the $140,000 of the right. belt plan, which is, you know, right. I think that's a very good, wise investment. Yeah. But coming out of it, it should be a, a low impact on the taxpayers um, with a better benefit. Right. It, it is not going to say things like, you have, you know, if you live in Shrewsbury, you have to have an electric vehicle by such and such a date. That's that's not yep. the intent of this plan. Great. I just want to make sure that, because sure. I think 
this can be everyone's question is, what's it going to do to me if this goes through? So it's not really going to, it's not going to tax, for lack of a better word, the individuals of Shrewsbury. It's going to put the onus on the government. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the committee? Okay, thank you. I think, of course, the best plan would be on a global scale, or at least a national scale, and as we know, that's not progressing at the right rate that we all wish it would. I mean, this is obviously a collective action problem. It's not going to get solved by Shrewsbury, but it is going to get helped by Shrewsbury. And more importantly, uh, I don't want to um, miss crediting the Commonwealth, which is also participating in it and allowing us to fashion this program. So at least there is some collective uh, action, some uh, attempt at a bigger solution. Um, we're not an uh, island in the wilderness working here, but we're certainly taking what options we have available, and some of these things do have to start locally. So it's, it's good to see it here, and I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes. Judy. Actually, only that uh, comment. I don't think that this is something, I think it's, um, I don't think it could start at the federal level. Of course, there's things that can be done, but I think it, it has to start at the local level. And I think that um, putting this plan together is absolutely um, the right thing to do. And I think Diane made an excellent point that if we don't put a plan together, we're going to continue to get, um, we're going to get, continue to get kind of a fire hose of ideas. And this is going to be um, bringing the, the best and brightest together, the ideas together and creating a, an actionable plan, as you say, for the town um, and good quality suggestions and information and resources for the residents. So personally, I think this is a no brainer. Um, so, and I do think that um, Shrewsbury has demonstrated that they've been looking for this, this type of thing. So I'm, I'm hopeful um, that this will, will pass you know, with, a, with a very good support. So thank you all for, for bringing this to us. Any further, further comments from the committee? I'd just like to thank the yes. people who came up and spoke today. You know, very good presentation, and uh, hopefully it works out. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, let's, um, let's tackle a couple more if we can. Articles 43 and 44 are next on our list, land transfers. Um, I already have some questions about these, but let's hear what you have to say before I start asking you questions about it. Mr. So Art Article 43 seeks to uh, transfer the designation of 105 parcels of land that were taken uh, for non-payment of, for, uh, for non-payment of taxes and foreclosed upon over honestly the last hundred plus years. Um, uh, since they were taken, they just sat there um, and we're looking to transfer their designation uh, to the care and custody of, from the care and custody of the tax title custodian to uh, the, the care, custody, and management and control of the town manager. Um, they would be uh, further uh, designated for study uh, and we would intend to come back uh, in future town meetings after working with various boards and committees um, and interested residents to determine an ultimate uh, final purpose for these properties. Some of it may be conservation, open space, parkland, but our primary focus at this time is to transfer them from tax title purposes to general municipal purposes. Um, this uh, also provides us a higher level of protection from adverse possession claims, which unfortunately we've experienced some in the past few years. Tax title properties are one of the few designated uh, designation types uh, that are subject to adverse possession. Uh, so this uh, not only gives us an opportunity in the future, but also protects the assets of the town that are currently in place. This is the result of a study we started last year, if I recall, to, to identify these properties? Several years Several ago. Years. Yep. Oh, yep. God. <laughs> okay. Uh, hmm. Donna, go. Kevin, do you have a list that we can all see of where these parcels are yet? Is yep. that all formulated? Yeah. It is yep. there? Yep. In the same section? Oh, oh, I did see that. Sorry. Yep. I did see that. Some Were some of these uh, small parcels or, or are these all yep. us usable? Some are very small. Okay. 
you know, may not be developable, but. Right, but that's the point is to, is to figure this out. Who is the, um, the uh, what's the term? Tax title custodian. Yeah. Tax title custodian. Yeah, is that actually you and this is just a, no, uh, a paperwork thing? That's the, it's the tax collector, the treasurer collector. Oh, is it? Okay, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and none of it can be handled that way right now under the uh, tax collectors? Town meeting only has the authority to change the... No, but I mean, but the reason we're transferring it to your office from their office is because your office is actually empowered to manage this and get a dispose of this. Right. The tax title custodian is only per, uh, has collected. the ability to dispose of the properties through auction or a sealed bid or something like that. And then in the end, because this is the, once we find uses for these, if we were to use them one way the, uh, uh, for sale or such, that, again, town meeting to, dis to distribute property. That is to, correct. To sell yeah. property. Yeah, further designations would fl flow back through town meeting. Okay. Donna? Okay, so I forgot about this list that I looked at, and I got dizzy looking at it. But um, So what I really want to know is, so if there are, say, two lots on Avon Ave, for example, are they just what the context of it? So, in other words, unless I go riding around town, I have no idea what these addresses mean. So, mm -hmm. the significance of it is it as big as this room? Is it as big as my yard? Is it, you know, mm -hmm. multiple? So, before you can figure out what you're going to can do with it, and before people think that we should dispose of all the property. Because that makes me nervous too, and I know Mo squirming down there because he was wasn't this what he was working on? So he was the chair of the public right. Rights committee. Right. So I guess it would be just nice to be able to have a visual of it somehow. Yeah, I mean we we do have a visual overlay that we can put up of all tax title properties in town. We're we're um, still trying to work through that. We can also put the square footages up if they're. Are particular parcels that anyone's interested in getting more information on you can contact me our office we can provide additional information and the GIS system is available through the town's website if you yeah. go to the website and just search for GIS you can just go address by address I know there's 105 of them and that's a little tedious but so let me say it another way the research has already been done Correct. So is there a way to say to translate it and say, gee, if everybody looks at the property, I'm going to just say Avon Ave because it's the first one on the list. If everybody looks at that property, do you know what, what we could do with that? Not, not yet. That's the next step. I know, but that, I think, is the exciting part. Because, that will be exciting next. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and, and the part that makes me nervous is I don't want us to rush to disposing of it. Well, we're not, it. we're not, ta so town meeting is the only, as you know, body that can give us authority to dispose of a piece of land. So what we're actually doing is, is, is further limiting the ability to dispose of the property by putting in a town meetings purview. Technically over if Avon Avenue was taken in 1915, at some point in time, the tax title custodian could have called for, you know, disposition, sale, bid, auction of the property, and it could have been disposed of. Now moving it into general municipal purposes ensures that any future action has to go back through town meeting. We're not seeking authority to dispose of any of these 105 properties at town meeting. Yeah. So, 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 so basically, not yet. So, so <laughs> basically yet. this is protecting, this is putting further protection on those 105 lots that is and giving the town and town meeting and probably finance committee as well a little input into what we're doing with that property going forward versus tax title first uh, could tax collectors could actually just put them out for auction tomorrow if sure. we didn't do this, yep. and then we'd have no say in it. It just go up for auction, and whatever we got for it, we'd get for it. So I think it's a no-brainer. Just yep, just lock it up and uh, under procedures and policies, and then we can figure out what to do with it. So my point is that's already happened in other circumstances. So mm -hmm. I I would just like us to. I know you've had it for a, a many many years longer than us but i just don't want to see town land 
dispose of. But, but this but will it, keep it from being It's not going exposed. to be. That, that's the no, point you, of this. No, you say it's not going to be, but it has been. So that's my point. But that's what this is. This is to make that not happen. It doesn't protect it. It does, because the town meeting, once it goes to this stage, it can no longer be disposed of Without by auction or something. It has to go through town meeting Definitely. for any disposition. Yes. 100%. Yes. That's the whole point of this. Stop making faces back there. I know. Shaking, yeah, shaking. <laughs> I know. Mo's got your back, Don. Don't, don't worry about this. We're cool. That's the point of this. Though. Is that right, Mr. Mizakar? That is correct. Okay. So your concern is the motivating factor behind this article, actually. And we've already lost through adverse possession. We've already had claims against some of the other. We have have claims, but we have not lost land. But we've lost time and effort to keep the land. Absolutely. So this is probably the the best solution for what we want to do as a town. Well, it's, it's a start. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else on the table up here want to chime in on this fascinating little bit of uh, legal minutia? Anyone from the public? Mr. Zikos, you seem to be interested in this. You got an opinion right there? Okay. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Mr. Molina, go ahead. Jason Molina, 31 Winchester Avenue. Um, if I'm going to ask a question now because I'm either here or town meeting. <laughs> uh, but um, is there two things? One, is there any uh, exposure um, to the town where is there any possibility of any claimant coming in, even a relative of, you know, of a claimant that's longer around to be able to claim this at all? These have all been properly foreclosed. Okay. Yes. And then um, I guess another thing to that. Um, I know this was a comment that was brought up at one of the board selectmen meetings uh, relative to this article, but um, are we 100% sure that there's nothing like in these lands that are, are puts us at risk in terms of any illegal dumping that's done in the past? Does it change any of this factoring based on? It does not. Okay. No, I mean, in order for the town to avoid, the town can take a uh, you know, dirty property and uh, avoid liability if it expediently attempts to resell it, and we've long missed that opportunity for okay. any of these. So if there is contamination, we're not further putting ourselves at risk for that liability. Okay, thank you. And then last question, if I may. Um, is this around, by, based on the, the amount of years around this, what makes this eligible, or is there like some other category where maybe something taken 50 years ago or 10 years ago or last year or yesterday? Is, it, is this just around the timetable of, of these there's no, there's no timetable associated with these. They do tend to be older and kind of forgotten about okay you know it wasn't you know um just speculating but there was a, a, always kind of like this overarching thought that any town owned land regardless of its designation was not subject to adverse possession but you know recently there have been court ca court cases that were ruled specifically on tax title if it's just sitting there under that designation it is and the courts have ruled in favor of an encroacher so um you know, we're trying to really clean that up and protect the assets. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molina. Anyone else in the public have any questions or comments? Questions from the board? The committee? Okay. Splendid. This is uh, good. I see this as cleaning up um, something, maybe generating revenue, or at least cleaning up our books. Um, I'm curious to see where this goes. Uh, what are we next? Article 44. So Article 44 um, is about four specific properties in town, 33 Eaton Avenue, 12 Cedar Road, 25 Harvard Avenue, and a portion of uh, the lot that is currently 210 North Quinn Sigmund Avenue. Um, these properties are also in tax title. Um, and <coughs> There have been on all of them but 12 Cedar Road, there have been, the town has identified encroachments upon those lands from abutters. Uh, many of these encroachments through satellite imagery, we can tell that we are subject to adverse possession. Um, earlier this, actually late last calendar year, uh, through my office, we took on an initiative to uh, identify any encroachments on town land with our lowest level flyover related to the stormwater program. Um, and seek that these encroachments are abated so we can preserve the town land. Um, these 33 Eaton Avenue, 25 Harvard, and two, a portion of 210 North Quinsigamon had encroachments on them. 
Um, they are in tax title. Uh, the town has no relevant need for this, and through conversations with um, those that are encroaching upon the land, um, they sought the opportunity to attempt to purchase the land. So when I say attempt to purchase the land, the only way the town is able to dispose of land is through uh, a competitive process. And competitive could be a sealed bid process. In certain limited circumstances, it could be offering it to every abutter to the property, um, or it could be through other means. So um, we are seeking the opportunity to uh, dispose of these lands, seeking authorization to transfer to the authority of the Board of Selectmen to negotiate uh, and enter into any agreements to dispose of, of these uh, four parcels of land with 210 North Quinn Sigamond only being approximately 9,000 square feet of 100,000 square foot plus property. So um, we have further exhibits about each parcel of the land up here for uh, your review. Uh, this is 33 Eaton Avenue. You can see the town owned property lies at the end of uh, the dead end road. Um, 12 seater, uh, there is currently no encroachment. Uh, it was taken through tax title purposes uh, and the abutter at 14 Eaton Avenue approached us about acquiring this piece of land. 12 Eaton Avenue is not developable in and of itself. Um, we would restrict any of all of these properties to not uh, allow them to further subdivide the lots once the town provides them to them. They would have to be combined with the lot that is currently owned um, and they would be restricted to the maximum of one single family home. So we'd require that all through the disposition prop, uh, process. Um, 25 Harvard Avenue has a small encroachment um, of the driveway at the corner uh, of the parcel. And 210 North Quinsigamond has an encroachment, including a driveway and a shed. Now, this is a prior drawing. We have since reconfigured this drawing to eliminate uh, the sale of the vernal pool that you see in the top right corner of the hashed out area. It would draw a diagonal line roughly from the current property line over to about where it says plus or minus, and then continue there to North Quinsigamond Avenue, uh, keeping the uh, vulnerable asset of the vernal pool in the town's uh, possession. So those are the four properties. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about our approach or thoughts behind this. So, so, so it looks like none of those properties in and of themselves would be buildable. So that's correct. Most likely it's going to be either the person already encroaching or someone abutting it that would be asking to purchase it. That's correct. So. So this isn't something we would be expecting to get high dollar value for because it's not usable land. Correct. Okay. Judy. But, but I can say oh, one sorry, last thing on. is if it did like this one here, that would, you know, 40% bigger lot for that person. So that would actually increase their property values by. It would, it would, it would put an untaxed parcel on the tax <laughs> roll right, of course, yeah, yeah. as well that they're already using, but you know, we would get fair value through yep. the negotiations. Yep. Oh. On these maps, the shaded area is the area that we're, is, that is the encroachment? Uh, the shaded area is the proposed part that we would dispose of, yes, mm -hmm. it includes the encroachment. Yeah. Right, okay. Thank you. Judy? Uh, so f for clarification, would it be the Board of Selectmen that would be negotiating with the party? Yes. It would be through their ultimate decision to dispose or not dispose of the parcel based upon terms and conditions. And what, uh, like, I, I guess what... Um, mechanism do you use to determine whether it's fair value or not? Well, so we have several, so we have one obligation is that if we sell the land for less than appraised or assessed value, we have to provide public notice of that through the state central register. Um, you know, each one of these negotiations would be their own and unique, and we would definitely start at uh, the fair assessed value of the property in, in the conversation. Fair um, assess value, the, the assessment that the town has made for the property. That's correct. Which I think traditionally is pretty well below market value for what things tend to sell for, if, is it not? Well, it has to be, according to state law, at least 90% of fair market value. So okay. it's not that far off. I mean, the market in these days can get well out ahead of things pretty quick. 
Um, the other alternative is is that we could, you know, spend funds to have the area appraised. You know, if we if it, you know, if we think that's necessary for any one of these. Because I mean, I don't know which which lot that is that you have up there. That's a pretty. I mean, I know you can take out the vernal pool, but. I mean, I'm not sure what the scale of that is, but that looks like a pretty good sized piece of property, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's 11,000 square feet, so it's a um, quarter of an acre. Yeah, so, yeah, but, yeah, okay. Yeah, but, okay. you know. But, I mean, I mean, some of some of what you showed are like slivers, which, you I'm know. I'm sorry, yeah, this will actually be 9,000 square feet because we're reducing the proposal. Right. So. I just want to make sure that, you know, obviously we want to, try to get this so that the property owner's happy, but also to get it on to, you know, the tax record. So as you say, we're, we're um, getting the, the tax income from it, but at the same time, I wanna make sure we're getting, sure. you know, a decent. Uh, and that's the intent. Okay. Yeah, this is a, you know, a, a straightforward real estate transaction. So you said if it was below, how much below the appraised price it has to? If it's, if. A penny below. Okay, it has to be what? Notif it? Notice for at least 30 days before entering into a binding agreement. Okay, and is that is that notice back in the day they used to put it in the paper? Is that what you're talking about? Or put it in the central register and on what's called combis, which is the state's. Okay. Um, God, I'm sounding old. The paper, it's not in the paper anymore. You would say combis. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Sure. Donna? If you look at the one on North Quinsigamon Ave, how does the town use the property? We don't use it at all. Existing property that abuts the encroachment. We don't use it. How I know, but how could it be used? For really, uh, I mean, we'd have to, you know, do an analysis of the topography and wetlands and all that. But in some ways, it's limitless. Or you know, other ways, you know, we could restrict ourselves for it be conservation or open space. Uh, this is a particular pro. A parcel where um, I otherwise would look for them to abate it, but satellite imagery clearly shows that they've adversely possessed the property for greater than 20 years. Oh. I mean, this isn't, you know, these things aren't, we're, we're not taking them lightly. You know, we've, we approached over 30 th property owners uh, since last October and demanding that they abate their encroachments. And we're down to this narrow list where we think that it's in the best interest of the town for us to consider disposition of the land. Okay. Just, just so we understand, um, encroachment is a very polite way to say um, construction trespass. <laughs> They've built a shed. They've built driveway. And in, I'm assuming, frankly, that it's entirely innocent, that it's just, hey, it's next to my house, there's nothing there, and they built there. But if it isn't innocent, you know, then they're they're, you know, trying to take possession, and it's there. They are certainly allowed to try, and instead of fighting them on it, you know, let's sell it to the only party who'd be interested, as long as we get fair market value, um, and like you know, we said earlier, get it on the tax rolls. You know, we've had we had a situation about I'm going to say six years ago where there was uh, encroachment. Um, it was I read a road or somewhere in that neighborhood. It was just someone's back porch encroaching on town property, and we just simply disposed of it by giving it to them or selling it to them at some reasonable price, maybe seven years ago. And even at that time, I was a little frustrated about it because I was like, hey, you know, this is not, you know, you, you don't just get to take the town land just because the town, you know, was too busy to notice, but that is how it works. It keeps the town honest and makes sure the town keeps an eye on its land. I certainly hope that we can dispose of all of these properly. Um, or certainly learn to manage them properly. Um, the ones that we've listed here, especially this big one, you know, big one, this uh, nice juicy one at, at 210 well, North Quinsig. And so. if I may, that just provides me an opportunity to reflect back on the prior Warren article. Now, if, the, if all 105 of those properties, including this one, 106, were designated for anything other than tax title, I simply say that send them a letter to abate and they have no case against us for adverse possession. So if it's in, you know, some other designation, um, you know, conservation, playgrounds, water purposes, you, you name it, it's, there's no possible claim for adverse possession. So we are 
taking care of a few specific examples where we're forced to, but with, again, with the prior article, we are putting that blanket protection or moving towards that blanket protection so we don't have these claims in the future, managing the land. Right. I just have one more. Yeah, go ahead. Is that where the town dump used to be? The parcel behind it, I believe. Yep. It abuts the town dump. Yes. Old town dump. So just the last question. Yeah, is, yeah. Um, so it's, it's fair market. If we can't get fair market value, we post it, and then whatever price we agreed on could go through? Yes, unless someone objects to the attorney general's office. Yep. Okay. And it's not necessarily an auction. It's not like it's going to has to sell, correct. right? That is correct. Yeah, you know, okay. Yeah. You know, but as long as, you know, we hold title to it and not under tax title, as long as since we're, we're already holding it, that's fine. But then we have to deal with the fact that someone's still encroaching on our land and we've got to move to the next step, which is not, doesn't make anybody happy. Well, the next so. step might be, would that be a legal step where we'd, yes. we'd be spending money to def either try to defend it? And at this point, it looks like we probably may not win that one because mm -hmm. it's been however many years in tax title and they've been on it for that many years. Correct. Okay. Any further questions on this? Yeah, Lena. I just have a quick question. So for the 105 parcels, how long do we think it will take to name the purpose or like um, designate what their purpose is? I think some of it will be really easy because a lot of it does, like we know a lot, some of those parcels are immediately adjacent to Dean Park and some of them are immediately adjacent to a piece of land that's already under conservation. Um, we just wanted to work diligently through it and not make assumptions and do something that we can't undo because once it gets into one of those higher restricted levels like conservation or playground purposes, you can't just undo it at town meeting. You have to replicate, you know, so if it's in conservation land and you take an acre of it and say we're going to, you know, change it over to general municipal purposes and build a pump station there or something like that, you have to replicate that conservation land somewhere else that's not already conserve, uh, conserved. So um, I think some of them will be really easy, but we just want to take that breath throughout the course of the summer. I think we will be back as soon as the fall town meeting to make further designations. Okay. Anyone else? Are we good? All right, that is article, oh, sorry, public. Go ahead, Mr. Zika. Podium, identify yourself, et cetera. Good evening, Paul Zikas, uh, 1 Beaver Drive, Precinct 1. Um, on these properties, my concern is that we're, in essence, rewarding bad behavior to your concern, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we don't know what the original intent was of the encroachment. Um, and to empower the selectmen to single-handedly negotiate what amounts to a private deal, again, I think it's the public perception of that that becomes a concern. Um, as many of you know, uh, that's precisely what town meeting did with uh, the Beale School, and there's been pushback on that um, and concern over that transaction. So why would we put ourselves in the same situation. And on the 105 uh, parcels, um, have all of those been reviewed for encroachments? They have. So if this goes through, um, it's reasonable to assume that people could then allege uh, an encroachment that maybe we didn't look at because we didn't visit each site personally? They've been reviewed for encroachments. Okay, but there's no master list with the size of the parcel and the map of the parcel there for is. the town meeting members to review? We do have that, yes. I, we'll, I said that we have a map of all tax title land that we would present. And does it have the size on that list? Well, the map would be to scale, but we can add the square footage of the property to the... And I think this is where, you know, town meeting needs to pay close attention because they're empowering... Um, the uh, the town fathers um, to take control of these assets when Massachusetts mothers. general laws and mothers yes Donna thank you so much um, and uh, Massachusetts general laws allows for um, the management and sale of these assets so 
it's not a problem that they're doing that. I think it's the way we go about it, and are we inviting uh, any any other additional issues or problems? Um, I think it's important for town meeting to look at those town meeting members that are duly elected and represent their areas to look at each parcel, see where it's located individually on a map, um, because we know it takes a lot of time to be a town meeting member. It takes a lot of time for all of you to volunteer your services. No one's going to sit at home and go to the GIS and enter into you know each address into that. So if we could put um, a a map together. Um, on each parcel so we can see how it relates to existing parcels like the question about um, the 9,000 square foot parcel um, that's contiguous to a larger piece of po property that the town owns so we're kind of cutting out 9,000 square feet to accommodate somebody that was encroaching on our land um, you know and, and and that seems kind of awkward to me um, and my concern is uh, again, um, determining value of these assets. Um, I know, you know, it can be subject to an appraisal, which can be cost prohibitive because the value of some of these may not be significant. But, for instance, did we get um, an appraisal on Beale School? Mr. Mizikar. How's that related to this article? I think it's very much related because it'll show the pattern of whether or not we were properly evaluating assets that you're asking the public to entrust to the Board of Selectmen's management and control. Which, which article are we talking about now, though, 43 or 44? We're talking about actually both of them. I think they are interrelated. Uh, they're actually two different articles because we're not seeking to dispose of any land in Article 43. Correct. But they, they came from the same pool, correct? They're all... They're all if you want to avoid the question on whether or not you got an appraisal for Beale, that's fine. Oh, the town didn't get an appraisal. That's been, that's okay. been present in public. So that's my concern when we entire. talk about getting an appraisal. That may not happen, right? I mean, it didn't happen previously on a more significant asset. So my concern is that it's probably not likely to happen. On I mean, these. We're, we're also not looking to build mixed-use developments for the benefit of the town center for any of these parcels so but we don't know I think that. we thoroughly explained the the intent of Beal and I don't know why we're talking about it right yeah Mr. Mazzica I'd like to it, I'd like to it, just it, stay on the topic of these, these could make somebody else's property general. buildable though so in the event that that they might. does that I think I've, we have to I've look at that and analyze it has not, has it not Mr. Yes. Mr. Card, that we, it was not going to why we're just trying to confuse the issue we're not confusing any issue I'd like to if I if I could I'd like to keep the comments directly to the disposition, the, the transfer um, in Article 43 from one office in this town to the other office in this town without any poss possibility of disposition, so that's not really an issue here for Article 43. And for Article 44, we're only talking about these specific articles. And if you want to talk about these specific, uh, these specific parcels, if you want to talk about these specific parcels, that's fine. But I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to bring up the Beal uh, disposition may be a legitimate issue, but not a legitimate issue for these articles. And I'd like to stay on topic. Otherwise, that's going to come up with every single article. No worries. I think it is important, though, to note that we're entrusting the selectmen to dispose of these and it, what appears to be private negotiations with people who are already chosen to own them. So, that's uh, right. If, Thank you very if much. I could just respond to that. So it, as I stated at the beginning of my comments, it has to go through a public competitive process. And I identified three different approaches to that. So I know there's attempts at a lot of confusion, but it's a public competitive process. Can, Thank you, Mr. Mizikar. Yes, Mr. O'Connell. Um, yeah, I was going to say one thing is these are five parcels. It's not guaranteed that the abutter is going to be the one to buy it. it. It could go a different way. We are giving the selectmen, you know, the power to do this, but there are some parameters, including fair market value. Um, if we don't think the fair market value isn't done, it is then put out where anyone can apply to the Attorney General to have the sale stopped. So, and it's very, very transparent right now. We're talking about this. Um, the problem I have is we only have 10 people here. I don't know how many are watching on cable, but we are talking about this stuff. We're making it available for people. And we've talked about the process. So, um, I, for one, am okay with the process as it goes through. I don't expect this you know, to be given to people. But just to clarify, they already have adverse possession claim, do they not? Some of them do. Of these parcels here. 
Correct. So it is very easy that we get into a court battle over that. Mr. O'Connell, uh, thousands, if not millions of people are watching. I've seen our Nielsen's. <laughs> They're great. Um, so only Game of Thrones has really done better. So, you know, I know we got a lot. We got a huge audience. Donna. Well, I, I just can't let this go by without saying something, even though it's not related to the two articles. The selectmen did due diligence on Beale, and it wasn't behind closed doors. It was very public. They followed a, a process that was excessive, and I take exception to you saying that. So I just have to say that because okay. I can't let it go by. I, can't. I, I know. That's, that's great. Is there anything else that's relevant to these two articles specifically? Because we've... We don't have an assorted, a short agenda, folks, so we got to get through these things. Judy, was there something you need to handle? No. Okay, great. So if there's nothing else on Article 43 and 44, uh, I'm going to keep going for just a little bit longer because now I've got adrenaline going. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go to Articles 11. Let's see how many we can do after that, if that's not a problem. So articles 11 through 17 will uh, describe or present the uh, operating and capital improvement budgets for all the town's uh, utilities. Um, three of the four utilities are operated through um, uh, the official designation as an enterprise fund through state laws, and the sewer utility operates through special legislation from the 1950s as the town was way out ahead of uh, how we wanted to manage uh, that. Uh, utility. So um, with us this evening is the DPW Director Jeff Holland, uh, DPW Business Division Manager David Snowden, and Water and Sewer Superintendent Dan Riley to guide you through this process. Thank you very much. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome back. What have you got for us? Good evening. Uh, so we'll start with Article 11, which is the Enterprise Fund associated with the Solid Waste Program. Uh, we had presented most of the information that the previous Finance Committee when we met with you, uh, but it, this is for the operating and the uh, contractual services of the enterprise account, Article 11. Is That's it? Questions? That's all you want to say? Okay. I mean, it's pretty okay. self-explanatory. Yeah. Well, we yeah, I mean, we had in, in that we've already race. done this <laughs> through our budget hearing. That's exactly. correct. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, but are there any change in these numbers since our budget hearing? Right. Yes, there are. Um, the, Amount of transfer from retained earnings has increased. Um, part of that was, as I mentioned, we received the pays you throw um, contract for the producing of the bags, and that we received it almost the day that we met you. So the, the figure that we presented was shy there. We also um, sought some additional funding to improve the yard waste program and to just make sure that we right size the position for the solid waste coordinator position that will be available for going public on July 1. So that increase uh, was, I think, 50,000 total. Um, I can get the exact number. I probably don't have you. 50,000, 52,050 or something like that um, in retained earnings. We made sure that the tax levy amount was not impacted by these changes. Fair enough, because it's because it's from retained. It's a re, in the retained earnings. Correct. Yes, and that, essentially that was money that previously came from the tax levy, so it seemed like it would be best used to supply that back to the residents. Yep. Sure. Okay. Uh, finance committee members, Donna. No, Dennis. Okay. No, we've been over this. Okay. Bo, well, Jason, or Paul, y'all got something on this? You good? You good? Okay. Article. Uh, article. The next uh, twelve. So Article 12 uh, funds the operations of our sewer system. Um, these numbers are consistent with what we presented at the um, budget hearings. And is there a change in them since our budget hearings? No. Okay. Hey, see, that's how you do it. So hide things is what you're saying. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Article 13 um, addresses the capital budget for the sewer system yeah. and um, this includes our capital improvement reserve and our special um, purpose stabilization fund as well as a slight increase in our sewer pump station improvements. Why do we have to do these as separate articles anyhow, the operating and the capital for the sewer system? Is it tradition or is there some other reason for it? Tradition in the past actually 
each of the separate articles for capital were done as separate articles. And through Kevin's uh, leadership, we've actually done all of the capital as one article. Okay. But for the uh, utilities. So for, the, for, the uti for each of the utilities. For each of the utilities, okay. Correct. So it actually, you have created a, uh, somewhat of a consolidation then. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. So is there any questions from the committee on Articles 12 or 13? Because you all got ahead of yourselves there a little bit. Take care. Sewer questions? Anyone from the back there? Okay. And... Uh, Let's do uh, water, 14. So Article 14 um, funds the operations of the water department. Um, these numbers are the same as presented. However, we did adjust, um, and I'm not sure if it's reflected, David's confirming, um, the appro appropriations in the nine account to reflect what we think is gonna be a 50%, up to a 50% increase in our chemical use, or chemical cost at the water treatment plant due to supply chain issues. So we um, we we have included that in here. Um, we're not sure of those numbers yet, but we're preparing for, you know, you know what we're seeing out there. And, you know, yeah. maybe, you know, hopefully no more than 20%, but I mean, it certainly could go up to uh, 50%. Okay, but that's still gonna be within um, allowable, fun well, well, you know, the available funds for the water department. And that's included in here. We, did, we made that adjustment since our budget hearing. Okay. And just for clarity, uh, the, the nine account is the, the uh, water treatment plant operations. So the one through six is the operations of the water department itself, and then the nine is for the plant. We separate out the plant. Oh, okay. Uh, questions, comments from the uh, committee? Don't be shy. Got the questions? No. Low. And then Article 15 funds the capital budget for the water department. Um, we finalized our number for water main replacement, um, $512,739. And then since our <coughs> budget hearing, we added $40,000 for the valve exercising equipment that we funded last year because we went out to bid and it was a lot more than what we had budgeted, unfortunately. And then um, we also included $5,000 for our obligation for Poor Farm Brook. All right. Any questions from the committee on the uh, water capital? All right, now stormwater operations. Oh, sorry, public? Public's not even listening to me. Come on, guys, give me something. I don't know, okay. Let's Air go to stormwater task. operation. Uh, stormwater operations is actually managed by Andy Truman, a town engineer, but he is, he took the, uh, he's on vacation today. Uh, so we're not going to budget it this year? No, oh no, we are going to budget it. Uh, so, but the, the numbers that are shown in Article 16 are the same as what were presented at uh, the budget hearings. And there's no change in, we did change some of what, how we're going to do some of the contractual services, but for all intents and purposes, the numbers have stayed the same. And, and we, we can fund, we fund the, it strictly through the utility. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the committee on stormwater operations? I'm going to continue my personal bugaboo about how the stormwater utility is funded through, um, as he, it's called a utility, but nobody has a chance to, to use it or reduce their usage of it. I know it's permitted by state law, okay. and I know the town meeting has voted for it. I, I still think it's, it's either badly named or <coughs> should be done differently and that ship has sailed but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let it go because even I've got something I can't let go so any other anyone else got any questions Donna you gonna counter me no okay thank you That's the right um, 886 is that uh, contractual service for is that all the street sweeping so so we use that for the fall street sweeping we use that for the catch basin cleaner we use that for our consultant who has, who's going to be helping us with our wet weather flow monitoring this year. It also funds some of our uh, uh, drainage improvements that we do. 
That nice. Is. Anyone else? Well, I guess to your point, if Go you ahead. don't use the 884 to do storm cleanup, certain people will get in to use that water in their basements. Oh, so. oh, it needs to be done. I don't, I don't so disagree with this work. It is, it is a public service. Oh, it absolutely is a public service. Anyone else? Anyone in the back? You're here. Might as well uh, chime in. Go for Random it. comments are welcome to. Okay. Um, and now I presume there's a capital budget for, yes, there's a capital budget for stormwater. Anyone want to tackle that? Stormwater capital. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeff, you got that? I'm sorry. Mr. Truman's surrogate. Yes, I'm just begun. I apologize. So the uh, Article 17 is for the capital portion of the stormwater, which doesn't do the stormwater improvements. And we are also out of this, we're going to purchase a uh, upgraded uh, catch basin cleaner. The one we have, I believe, is from the 90s. This is the gadget that? It's the clam scoop. Ship. That is correct. OK. So you're getting a fancier scoop? A uh, newer scoop <coughs> with probably a little bit stronger cable. OK. Mm. And get the little prizes and the toy out of the box. You'd okay. be surprised what we pull out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I brought it up. Donna. Is that done twice a year still? The catch, so we catch, ba catch, no. so catch basins. We have we do it two ways, but we do them about every other year. It's not. I thought it was required twice a year. Oh, uh, that's the uh, street sweeping. No, I thought that was too. No, so we so we actually clean catch basins once a year. We have about six thousand catch basins. Uh, we have a contract that does about two thousand to twenty five hundred, and the town does between five hundred to a thousand. However, we are starting to get, well, we've been required to monitor the amount of volume of material we remove from each catch basin for the last four years or so. And we are now getting to the point where we can actually start uh, signaling out basins that we don't have to go to on a more routine basis because if we're pulling out a paint can full of sediment and they're designed to hold uh, four feet of material, then we don't need to go back to those. So we're starting to act. We have a spreadsheet, and we're going, back, going to be able to start um, reducing some of those. And where do you dispose of it? At the landfill. So we are very fortunate that we actually have will that we can actually dispose of both our street sweepings and our catch basin cleanings at the landfill. We started doing that about four years ago, was it? Oh no, we've been we've been able to go there probably since the wheel of Brady took over there. Oh really? Yeah. Oh okay, good. Very good. That is a perk that we have. It's our landfill. I mean, right. I'm, not, I'm not that thrilled. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, if not, we would have to pay to have it disposed, and it's considered a hazardous material. Mm. Yeah, no, no, understandable, but still. Okay. I always wonder where that went. Anyone else questions from the table? From the audience? <coughs> Viewers at home? Okay. That is it for that section. Let us tackle articles. Uh, where, where are we next? Article one. Yeah. Let's start at the top. Um, article the first, which is to receive reports, which for some reason we actually have to move and approve. I don't know why that is, but I'm not going to question it because it's easy to do. So the this would be an update from the Beale Early Childhood Center Building Committee. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just the Building Committee. That's it. Okay. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to break us before we get to article, the art discussion of Article 2. I know we're going to skip over it right now. Um, if he's watching at home, I'd like Mr. Kane to perhaps come in on our next meeting or at least send us a reason, a little d detailed description of what he wants changing about town meeting time and the pros and cons and what that's all about. Um, and maybe I can just send him a, or Mr. Mrs. Carr can send him a note. Or, or do you know if he was planning on speaking to us anyway on Article 2? Um, I would be happy to provide the core updates of it. I don't think the moderator is intended to come in. Um, mm -hmm. If we get through everything else tonight and you'd like me to talk about it, I'd be happy to do that. Well, he's the one who mentioned it. I think it was either at, was it special or was it at last? Oh, yeah. Annual. He's, he's mentioned it uh, both yeah. times. Okay. Yep. I, I thought this was his own personal. It is his initiative. His initiative. Yes. I have a question about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, can you buy town meeting time someplace? It's 10 copies are made available at the at library. At the library, but can you buy one? Yes. Yep. 
I don't know where. Amazon? I'm not sure. Apparently, so, Jeff's got a comment to make on this. Oh, Jeff's or a moderator. Copy. Yeah. <laughs> so as a fellow moderator in my hometown, uh, you can get it from the Mass Moderators Association. Be sure to get yours today. I love those. I have Robert's Rules of Honor, and I'm yeah, no, curious I, what's in it. Hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm all down with that. I'm just kind of curious. I mean... There's plenty of good reasons. I just feel like if we're going to make a change to something that I do remember Mr. Byrne always making jokes about it, how we've been using something that, you know, predates George Washington's teeth, it would be nice, you know, to have a presentation to that effect. But if Mr. Mizikar is going to handle it when we get to it, that's fine. I'm not worried about it. Wow, I'm off topic. Let's go to Article 3, however, um, which is prior year's bills. Do we have any? We do not have any. I don't think that needs further discussion then. There's no questions from the committee or the public. Okay. Um, I did have one question on that. It, what? It has a one dollar with no bills. We're doing you you got to put something there. Yeah. We just vote to defeat it. Okay. Yeah. And of course, th that may change between now and then, but I can't imagine it will, and we'll probably recommend <laughs> defeat. Um, let's move to uh, Article uh, Four. Four, which is for current year's bills, right? That is correct. Current transfers within the operating budget, which we do not have any of this time. Now, why does that not have a, a $1 bill on it if the other one did? I don't know. That was <laughs> kind of my point is one. Half yeah. One didn't. I had a quick answer for that last one, but I don't know why we didn't. I think it was still a placeholder that we were waiting to see if there was anything. But usually don't we have like a one as a placeholder? Yes. Yeah, I mean, ultimately when we... Before we ship this out, we'll add. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, thanks, Dennis, because honestly, I might not have noticed if you hadn't mentioned it. Uh, article uh, the fifth. Oh, that's the good one. All right. The, are these the current numbers, or are these the placeholder numbers from last year? These are the, new, these are okay. the numbers, and they have not changed you. since your hearings. Um, Previously, there have been no adjustments to the operating budget. And we will just have a line item budget inserted. The line item budget will be inserted uh, in the details of this sworn article. That's right. At the appropriate object level. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking. I don't. All right. Any questions from the committee on? The town's operating budget, which is, I guess, the best way to summarize Article 5, the main operating budget. And yeah, this is the same numbers we've already discussed, correct? Right. That is no, correct. It's, no, um, zero changes. Zero changes. Zero changes. Yeah, okay, article, uh, public, any questions on the budget? Honestly, it's always the biggest, uh, it's the most important thing we do, folks. Everything else is just uh, politics. Okay. Article 6, which is effectively the money from Selco um, for the cable. Usually we do electric before cable, but this year we're doing cable before electric. I don't care. They're just here, 6 and 7, instead of 7 and 6. Um, this is under contract that the selectmen arrange with Selco. Is that right? The franchise agreement. The franchise agreement. Yes. Do we, since we haven't had our Selco review, which I would really like to have, even though there there's not an obligation, they're not a department of the town. But I think that members of this committee, um, if if they're at all like me, want to understand Selco better, and the residents of the town who get to uh, the millions who watch this um, fastidiously would love to know how Selco works. And they'd love to know how the franchise agreement works, even though I understand some of it is not necessarily public business. Um, is there a concern that the cable? franchise will be decreasing over the years. Will, is, is there a threat to this source there, of there revenue? There is a threat to this source of income, but um, the other side of um, Selco's dollar on the electric side, I think uh, we have plenty of opportunities to reconsider that pilot. Okay. I mean, we would regardless. Well, we haven't reconsidered the electric pilot in quite some time. Oh, and I, and I appreciate that happening, frankly. So... Um, okay. Any questions on the cable portion of the Selco franchise deal? Pay your bills, folks. Okay. Uh, Article 7, 
the electric side of the Selco. This is not a, this is not the same, right? This, this, uh, the same. this but this number is still set through a franchise agreement. No, but it's a negotiated payment in lieu of taxes for their asset. This one is pilot. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions on Selco Electric Pilot? Just my question would be, how often do we renegotiate the pilot, or is it? No, no set term. No set term. It's been quite some time. Yep. Is it on the agenda for anytime soon, or? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we so the cable franchise agreement uh, is up in um, calendar year 24, like January. Yep. So we're beginning conversations and negotiations for that, and yep. it'll be part of a well yeah, be conversation. A package deal. Yeah, correct. Makes sense. Is this something the town manager's office handles, or is there a different co committee? Well, the, the board of selectors <coughs> is a franchise uh, issuer. You know, they issue the license for the franchise agreement, so ever, it flows through them. And, mm -hmm. and the pilot um, would as well. So I just... Bob Holland might be watching, so I don't want to discuss no, I the negotiation strategy. No, I, I, I'm <laughs> again. This is the larger picture of the, how the town is involved and what happens with the town. Yep. And uh, Bob's definitely watching. I know him. He, we know he's watching because yeah, I'm he not watches asking this stuff. Yeah. The tactics. He, he is our audience. <laughs> you, you left a big one out there. that hadn't <laughs> negotiated. So yeah, that, no, but that's fine. It, yeah. Again, this, this is just me eager to figure out how the system works. Okay. And. Um, this Article 8, by tradition, used to be the end of the night, but we've now moved it up closer to the town budget, but it is the free cash allocation of half a million. Now, that number has been the same for as long as I can remember. Right. Um, why is that, and is there, since the size of the town's operating budget has grown, won't, shouldn't that number grow in proportion? I, I would make the opposite argument that uh, we'd be better off in sustaining while I have no objection or concern of using $500,000 in free cash, it is a one-time use of revenue in an ongoing operating budget. So, um, or, you know, in, in our ongoing operations. So I wouldn't really consider increasing this because we're just putting ourselves at risk. That the bigger the number gets, if free cash doesn't keep up, then we won't have that available in the next cycle and we'll be short. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't we be better off trying to bring that down to zero? In theory, yes. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns from us or from them in the back? Anyone on the free cash? Okay. Um, Article 9 is the new special purpose. Well, not, it's now it's getting old, but it's wonderful to have. Special purpose override stabilization account. Would you like to introduce this sure. and explain it Absolutely. to the audience? So when we built the, uh, proposed the override to the community in May of 2021, we were looking for a longer term, more sustainable way of seeking funds to overcome the limitations of Proposition 2 and a half. And the use of an override stabilization account allows us to do that. So essentially what we do in the early years after an, uh, an operating override is we add money into a stabilization account, basically a, a savings account that we'll draw upon in the future um, to extend the life of the um, override and stabilize and prevent swings in uh, operating revenues that are available to us in the future. So this is the second opportunity to uh, enact a budget after the passage of the override. Uh, we currently have a little over $3.2 million in the uh, override stabilization fund. Uh, we'd be adding another 3 million, taking us a little over 6 million. Um, initial indications for um, just moving the budget for, forward shows that um, year three, we would add a little bit of funding, maybe $500,000 to the override stabilization fund. And then in uh, out years, we'd begin to draw funds out of this to, again, maintain service levels in the out years. And that's exactly what it's intended. This is a savings account for future operational use. <coughs> Questions, comments from my colleagues up here. Uh, the only question I have is, so far, you know, we haven't had to touch any of it. We can put it away, so everything is working as planned as, you know, the whole 
you know, select board select and everyone else right. in the whole process was for the override. So we're we're on track. <coughs> and are we a little bit ahead of track? A little, a little ahead, right? So when the board selectmen were able to look at the revenues and and provide parameters for the operating budget this year, they identified and communicated that. Um, you know, they were able to extend an additional four years. So that, that means that this override is projected to get five years instead of the original four. So we're actually so, doing better than yeah, a whole year. Projected. Yeah, a whole year. Yep. So, so that's, that's correct. Really good news. Yep. Yeah, I'd like to not downplay that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I think the more the more we mention that the better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, good news. You want me to say nice it again? Hear. Hmm? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I said do you want me to say it again? Say what again? Okay. In a little bolder, yeah, deeper exactly. voice. But, but no. seriously, it is, it, you know, that's yeah, really good news. Part of it is just, you know, the, the fortuitousness of the situation, but it's also decent fiscal management that we really work hard on. And I'm glad to see it happen. I'd actually say right I think here. the real key is that they worked hard on putting together a doable plan doable. more than any fortuitous events. They, they did their homework. Article, any questions on this uh, from the audience? Article 10 um, is the capital budget, the omnibus capital budget. And although we're calling it omnibus, we're actually not including the utilities. But that's okay because they're yep. sort of different anyhow. But this is everything else. Am I right, Mr. Mizakar, that this is You're all the capital it. budget? That ain't that. That is correct. It's okay. It's capital budget that's been narrowed. Um, so it's $1,463,161. There have been changes since we went through these on a department-by-department department basis during your budget hearings, and I'd like to point a couple of those things or all of those things out to you. First and, first and foremost, uh, because of the duration of the rollout of the police CAD and RMS software system, it will take, um, you know, up to a full fiscal year. We're going to spread the cost of that investment out over two fiscal years. Um, it does not add to the total cost, but we're just not going to fund it all in the first year. So it just gives us more flexibility in the future. Again, doesn't add any total cost to us. It suits kind of the overall spending model a little bit better. So uh, you'll remember that was a $433,000 investment. We'll fund half of it this year, half of it next year. So that's one of the changes. The uh, taser bundle was adjusted slightly uh, less than $1,000. With regards to that, uh, excuse me, less than ten thousand dollars. It was sixty-two thousand dollars. It's up to sixty-eight thousand uh, dollars. The other substantial change, um, two other substantial changes. We removed the um, water service connected for the Oak Middle School. Uh, Reprioritized uh, those funds, um, putting um, that project off. Um, we will uh, be making an investment using a transfer of funds of existing um, funds that were dedicated to the high school away from renovating classroom space and, and to increasing or upgrading the lighting system in that building to LED lights, which will save us money in the future. So that's the 99902 That was not on the uh, docket when we discussed this uh, in the, in the uh, budget hearings. Uh, the other significant change is because of MSBA requirements, we've removed the Oak Middle School uh, project and uh, placed that into its own separate warrant article. They ask that we do that. So uh, those are the changes. It's, a, it's an overall decrease in the total amount of, money that we're go amount of funding that we're going to utilize because of those changes. Uh, happy to answer any questions. So the Oak project is an exception to the capital budget. That came out as well. That came out. Folks, any questions from the colleagues up here on the Finance Committee table? No. Anyone in the back uh, or at the table? Anybody else want to say anything on the <coughs> allegedly omnibus capital budget? I will uh, thank you all. I think now would be a nice time for us to close the public hearing if I have no objections. Move we close the public hearing. Second. We can, oh, wait, just a moment. To be continued. We will, yes, with the idea of taking it up again in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Legal language inserted here. April 26th. 28th. 28th. Excuse me, 28th. 6 p.m. That was my six. <sighs> yeah, I was really hoping we could do seven, but after tonight, yeah, uh, no. So 6 p.m. it is.
Uh, so there was a motion there. I'm second. That was a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. The public hearing is closed. Hold on. We aren't done. No. Y'all can go. But our meeting continues. Sorry, folks. I know you're all getting excited. There's, <laughs> there is more agenda. I mean, you're also welcome to leave, but, but quorum is perilous, and you're in a hurry for me to keep going and not talk anymore. Okay. We are going, it says deliberation and action relative to the recommendations that will also be held off until we actually have articles oh. on which to deliberate and act thereupon. Mm -hmm. I mean, in theory, we could act on the current ones, but I'd really rather not because the public hearing isn't actually over and maybe something needs to get reopened. Is that okay with the, with the yep. committee? Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> so now we have this fancy report to consider. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to comment on that. Go ahead. Fancy report. Sure. The second paragraph, I, I find it concerning. I, I understand what the selectmen do, but the selectmen are separate from the finance committee. This is the paragraph that says the Board second of Selectmen's financial. Yes. So I just want to make sure we're on the it same. It says the Board paragraph. of Selectmen's financial policies and financial objectives reviewed and updated in November 2021 became the basis for this budget which may be what the town manager has done, but it's not what the finance committee does. And I find that to be a confusing statement to someone picking it up and reading it because we're a separate board and we don't have to do that from my understanding. Am I right? Sure. So I find that statement to be misleading. Would it be better if it said guiding principles because it would be disingenuous to say it doesn't I, I don't basis think, really I, I hear you but we need to find a way to be sure that we're independent of the well we're not when we collaborate with them we collaborate <laughs> with them but we're, we're a separate entity and I think that statement is confusing to the public because it's confusing Dennis to go ahead is this statement just saying that the budget that's been presented for us to review as a finance committee was based on the, the principles the selectmen came up to I mean I'm reading this that the budget that was put in front of us, because we, we don't build the budget, was based on those selectmen principles. The town manager works for the yeah. selectmen. Yep. Mm -hmm. We don't. Right. And I think we need to be able to keep that separate. I don't, but I don't think that is confusing in this line. I, your points are absolutely yeah. correct, but I don't think that's what this line is. I, I certainly don't see that. <clears throat> I think if, if I were to pick this up and I weren't a member of the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee over the years, I would think, oh, we, we have to do what the Board of Selectmen say in their policies, and we don't. Uh, well. We don't. It does say it became the basis of this budget. But that's for, the, that's for the town manager's statement because he works for them. We don't. I understand that. The way I see it is that's uh, frankly what, what, what has uh, happened exactly. here. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. So if, if, if we take the following paragraph, which says the town manager, this starts the town manager, I say the town manager filed an initial budget proposal based upon the Board of Selectmen's financial policies and objectives. <laughs> which that's fine. Okay. Because that's what it is. Correct. The person writing this could be slanted towards the Board of Selectmen. Probably. I, I, I read it the same way both They're ways. not listening the to way you. you it's read okay. it. You can be honest. The way you... The way you just read it and the way I read it here, I get the same take. Sure. It. But if it's clearer for but other now, people. But now Donna and the well, people she's concerned about. I'll give you an example. We'll see it. An example is you and I know what it means. You and I know what happened. Someone picking this up and all of a sudden it becomes gospel five years from now when that statement is included in this report year after year after year. And, and then they'll think, oh, well, that's what we do. But we don't. So I like the way the town manager changed. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I, okay. I, it was clear to me, but I'm fine with that because if it's unclear to people, right. just clarify it. Any other, uh, any other comments on this? When is this? When are we publishing? When are you? When is publishing happening? Twenty ninth. Okay, so the day after. So we have till that meeting. Yep. Um, so the fact that we may not vote on recommendations by then. Um, 
you know, becomes I mean, a question. You of, vote on most of them by then, though. We might, yes. That 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 could that could very well be the case. We'll, I mean, we're well, well through see. the warrant at this point. Hmm? We're well through the. Oh warrant. yeah, I mean yeah. Yep. Might I also say, compared tons to of it. Go ahead. Compared yeah. to years of writing these and fighting over what's in them and over craziness, this was well done. So I Alex. say thank you. You saved us a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I did have a small question. Go ahead. Um, should Hannah's name be included in this or not? I was just about to say that. Can you please put Hannah's name, even if it's just to, you know, you can mention comma, resign such and date, or just sure. something. Mm -hmm. I'd appreciate that. you have that. to do that with the other person? Yeah. Oh, He's yeah. already here. Alan's did someone else resign? We lost uh, Alan. Alan. So. He resigned last this week. So he's not actually approving any of these by, by vote. So. Well, that's always that's the the thing. It, it looks like these folks are all voting for it. Right. right. Would you like yeah. us to recognize them prior to the signature block? Yes. Yeah. Good solution. Is that okay, Donna? Sure. Donna likes it. I think it's great. She thinks it's great. You don't have to write that down. No. And I'm not going to ask us to vote on the language of this, first of all, because Mr. Mizcar is going to scribble a little of the changes, and also because I'd really like to have as many of those actual people actually voting on this, meaning uh, having Rajiv here, uh, just to have his say so on the 28th. And Vikram. Hmm? And Vikram. And Vikram. Yeah. There you go. That's what's missing. Not the same without him. Okay. Uh, other comments, questions, or concern? Carlos is looking at his watch, folks. <laughs> I'm text. I see all. I've been working, looking at mine for. You've actually half been getting hours. work done. I hope you're not billing for this. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else on? Okay. So, are you? Do you have guidance then on how to tackle this for the next? We think so. Yeah. And then we'll put it to bed for, at the next. We'll meeting. get it out to you uh, well in advance. I appreciate it. Um. Next article on this is to review the schedule. Two weeks we are finishing, fingers crossed, more, at least handling the rest of the articles as best we can. Um, six o'clock on that Thursday. Uh, do, 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 do. May 19th, which is two days before town meeting, we will be, if I'm correct, there will be pre-town meeting right back here in this room with the town manager and, and as many town meeting members as choose to show. Um, lots of them often do. And then when that adjourns, we will begin our meeting. Um, but that starts at 7. Go. I was just going to ask that we do as much as we can on the 28th so that because depending upon how long that pre-town meeting runs, it's really – Frustrating and difficult yeah. for people who have to go to work in the morning, not me, um, <laughs> for the, for the pre-town meeting and then to sit down and have to start a meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful if you get as much done as you can. I'm hoping we can get through just about all of it. And really, it would be nice if we were just voting on the articles that hadn't come to the planning committee, uh, the planning board yet. Mm -hmm. So that way we... What I'm really trying to avoid is having us on the stage voting on stuff before Last the meeting. Minute. I want to have it done at pre-town meeting. And since we have this rare opportunity of having a meeting two days before, it would be nice to do that. Yep. Um, and maybe Mr. Mizikar we could get a, a Selco thing then? Huh? Huh? Or maybe that can wait till June. I think they would wait. Okay. Yeah. Wait till June. <laughs> I can read I the motion. June. Like <laughs> I think you should do it in July. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, June. And then on Saturday the 21st, starting at 8.30 in the Oak Middle School Auditorium, uh, we will have annual town meeting. And unlike Westboro, we will be done at a reasonable time. We don't break for lunch or anything. Like, is, is it just, can we bring food? Okay. If you want to eat oh, on just... stage in front of everyone. <laughs> oh, is that what that was? I was okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I'm bringing food. Okay. Uh, let's see. Other business. We have an. I don't even know what that means. Moving on. Correspondence. We've got information from the town manager about fiscal projection two. Um, suggested order of what we handled tonight, and a letter from oh the assistant planner uh, regarding some of the stuff we handled tonight. There was also correspondence uh, from. Um, Alan Gerald, who uh, resigned 
uh, which came in after all this. But uh, that's why we are short someone tonight. And um, we also got a correspondence from residents who wanted to come tonight. Again, that came in before this agenda was written. Uh, seeing no other business, is there a motion to adjourn? adjourn. Is there a second? second? Non debatable. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.